How's it going, folks? Welcome to another fun at-home table read. Tonight, we are jumping into The Unmade Alien 3, uh, written by William Gibson. I'm really excited to see this one or read this one because I love the series. So we're just going to start introducing ourselves. Go for it. I'm Kate Cassidy. I will be reading the action description tonight. Hello, I'm George, and I'll be playing Hicks. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm playing Spence. Hi, I'm Anne, and I will be Jackson. Hello, I am Mary. I will be playing Tully. And I'm Logan. I'm rereading Bishop. All right, Kate, take us away. Right. Alien 3, Fade In, Deep Space, The Future. The silent field of stars eclipsed by the dark bulk of an approaching ship, closer, angle on the hull, the towering cliff of metal, Suleiko. Interior Suleiko hypersleep vaults, tracking down the line of empty open capsules, frozen twilight. The final four capsules are sealed, lids in place. Angle inside the capsule, Newt, then Ripley, Hicks next, his head and chest bandaged, then Bishop in his call of plastic, but the lid of Bishop's capsule is misted with the hothouse condensation. Closer, a tear of fluid streaks down the condensation. An alarm sounds. The monitor begins to scroll data, tied on monitor. Troop transport, Suleiko, CMC, 846A, Beta, mission level 426, return, status, red, treaty violation, reference number, cause, navigational error. Bland feminine voice of the ship's computer as the alarm continues to sound. Attention, due to failure of navigational circuitry, Sulaco has entered a sector claimed by the Union of Progressive Peoples. Auxiliary systems are now online. Course corrected. Hardwired protocols prevent, repeat, prevent arming of nuclear warheads in the absence of diplomatic override, decryption standard Charlie 9. On preset course, Sulaco will exit the UPP sector at 1900 hours, 53.8 minutes. Exterior Sulaco. The ship slides past beneath us. A UPP interceptor descends into frame, matching course and speed with Sulaco. The interceptor settles on Sulaco like a wasp. Interior, three commandos climb into spacesuits. The leader opens a hatch in the deck, revealing one of Sulaco's airlocks. First commando, a young Vietnamese woman, scrambles down and attaches magnetic units to the airlock. Second studies a monitor tapping out a sequence on a keyboard. The first gestures from the hatch, no good. The second tries again, a grating sound as Sulaco's airlock begins to open. Interior cargo lock, darkness. Armed commandos climb through openings and descend a ladder. Reaching the deck, they fan out weapons ready. Their leader examines the damaged drop, damaged drop ship. First commando gestures urgently. She's found something. Bishop's legs broken, grotesquely twisted. Still in fatigues, the white android blood clotted into powder. First and second commandos exchange looks through their faceplates. Attention, integrity breach, cargo lock three. Security alert, integrity breach, deck, B deck. Interior hypersleep vault, leader's point of view, the chilly Isle of capsules. Commandos move down the line, guns poised. They peer in at Newt Ripley Hicks, but the lid of Bishop's capsule is pearl white. The leader tries the controls at the foot of the capsule where green and red indicators glow. Nothing happens. He opens a panel, finds an emergency lever, tries it. The green indicators wink off. The lid rises, a dense pale mist flows out, spilling over the edges of the capsule, revealing the gray ovoid of an alien egg. Rooted in the tangle of Bishop's synthetic entrails, the egg instantly ejaculates a face hugger, which strikes the leader's face plate in a spray of acid. He screams, blinded by the acid, grappling with the thing that as it begins to force its way into the, his helmet, its tail lashing furiously. Clawing at it, he plunges blindly back down the aisle, stumbling, smashing into the empty, empty castles. He vanishes through the entranceway, his screams giving way to frenzied gagging sounds. The first commando scrambles after him. Interior cargo lock. The leader writhes on the deck beside the main cargo lock. First commando rushes in, crouches beside him, takes careful two-handed aim with her sidearm. She fires, attempting to kill the face hugger without hitting the leader. The face hugger explodes in a gout of acid, ragged holes burn through the side of his helmet. First commando frantically works the lock controls. As the inner lock opens, she shoves the leader over the edge with her foot. Exterior. Helmetless, headless, trailing a cloud of blood and acid, the leader tumbles through space. In the cargo lock, eyes of the first commando through her faceplate, a beat. Something moves behind her. 
She spins, bringing up her gun, back like in the entrance of the vault, a black multi-armed figure. The beam from her lamp finds it, the second commando, with Bishop in his arms. Dissolve to exterior anchor point, Wayland yutani Corps outpost in deep space, various angles. A situation the size of a small moon and growing. Unfinished sections of a hole are open to a vacuum. The vast irregular structure, the result of shifting goals of successful administrations, move in on hundreds of windows, most of them dark. A light comes in one of the windows. Interior anchor point, Tully's sleeping cubicle. A phone is ringing. The cubicle, terminally sloppy, resembles the nest of a high-tech hamster, not much larger than the, a berth on a train. The walls are plastered with a wistful collage of posters, ads, photos torn from magazines, beaches, desert, the Grand Canyon, redwoods, blue sky, a hedge against claustrophobia, and the emptiness of space. Tully sitting up in bed, knuckling sleep from his eyes, wincing at the light. He slaps the phone console and the glum face of the operations officer, Jackson, female, appears. She wears a nylon baseball cap with a computer light pen attached to the bill. Morning, Tully. Morning. Jesus, Jackson, it's the middle of my downtime. Close on the console of the screen. Angle, the room begins. Jackson is anchor points, nerve center, the ops room. None of us up here in the ops room have seen our, any downtime for a while, Tully. Marine transport came in an automatic 16 hours ago. She bobs her head as she speaks, using the pen on her cap to move a cursor on the screen in front of her. The Sulaco departed Gateway four years ago with a complement of 15. A dozen Marines, uh, an Android, company representative, and a former warrant officer of a merchant vessel. So? So BioRito gives us the warrant officer. One, count them, one Marine and a nine-year-old girl. Makes you wonder what happened out there, doesn't it? So ask him, wake him up and ask him, them, not me. But that's the good news, Tully. Three hours before Sulaco turned up, we docked a priority shuttle out of Gateway. Two passengers, Millie, Cy, and Tully. I'm sorry, two actor. What is that? Millie, Cy, Tully, weapons division. That the bad news? They want that ship pulled in with full biohazard precautions by 0800 hours. Biolab techs are priority for the deck squad. That's you, Tully. The phone screen goes blank. Shit. He begins to fumble through his sleeping bag, looking for his clothes, disturbing Spence, a young technician who sits up groggily, huggling, hugging the bag to her press. What? What is it? It's called the military industrial complex. It's called my ass out of bed. It's called jerking me around. Anyway, anyway you want to call it, it's the same bullshit. Interior corridor. Tully, groggy and irritated, emerges from his cubicle wearing a battered leather flight jacket. Its sleeves plastered with embroidered logo patches for various products. His photo, name, job description, and number are slotted on the door in a transparent envelope. Tully, Charles A, Tech 5, Tissue Culture Lab. Dissolve to interior dry deck. A plane of gray steel, the size of several carrier decks, walls lost in dark and distance, service vehicles, lumber pass in the background, massive floods on towers of raw scaffolding backlit, 20, 20 waiting figures, the deck squad. Their spacesuits are white, clinical. Over these, they wear disposable biohazard envelopes of filmy, translucent plastic. Some are colonial marine, colonel marines armed with pulse rifles or flamethrowers. Others are scientists and technicians carry recording and sample gear. Their voices over helmet radio are heard with static. Something clangs and booms overhead, metal thunder. Duck squad, brace for pressure drop. She's in the cradle, she's coming in. A sudden wind rushes across the deck, then dies. Rumble overheard a monstrous hangar door rolls slowly open revealing the naked stars. The dark hole of Sulaco blots out the stars as it descends. Entry team to secondary cargo lock. A cherry picker vehicle with extended boom winds up to Sulaco. The lock sighs it open on darkness. Interior cargo lock. 
buzz of static, indistinct radio exchanges as half a dozen light plays, lights play over the drop ship, the walls of the lock. Tully enters, stares round, eyes wide through his faceplate. Beside him is a Marine with a pulse rifle, obviously psyched for combat. Lights. How come they got no lights? Hey, man. He shines his light on a blackened scar in the bulkhead. Look at that. Been some action in here. Action? Man, what the fuck are you supposed to be doing here? Forging a new home for mankind in the deeps of space. The Marine isn't amused. Tully raises an instrument. It makes a sucking noise. Collecting atmosphere samples. So, uh, just do it, right? He moves away. Sure. But he doesn't want to be alone. Hustles after the Marine. Technician Tully to the hypersleep vault. Atmosphere samples. <laughs> Sounds like you. Yeah, let's not keep the man waiting. Interior entrance to hypersleep vault. The Marine officer holds a tracker, one of the small motion sensors familiar from the pre previous film. Beside him are two more Marines. The officer raises the tracker and scans the face of the door. Extreme close up of the tracker screen, zero. Angle on the officer. One sample here. Sound of Tolly's device sucking air. Got another on the way in. Have they patched on the line yet? Yes, sir. Lights on in there. The officer presses a button. The door slides open, bright, white, the aisle, empty. A row of capsules, Tully's Marine is first through the door. Gun ready, slow, careful. Tully steps in after him, rises his instrument, takes a sample. Interior hypersleep vault. The other two Marines move past Tully. Soft scuff of their boots on the deck, Tully doesn't quite know what to do. Lowers his sampler, hesitates, the first Marine reaches Newt's capsule. He lowers his rifle. They're here. Eight inches of razor sharp serrated tail plunges through the back of his suit as he's lifted off his feet by something we can't see. Ugly ripping noise as the alien draws, alien draws withdraws its stinger, blood tidally contained by the translucent membrane of the biohazard envelope. The stinger of a second alien whips around the neck of one of the other two Marines. The alien is clinging to the ceiling. He screams. Tully, Tully's Marine sags against the roof of Ripley's capsule. His arms across the controls. The green indicator lights go out as the first alien lunges up into view. Close on the jaws, angle on Ripley. Her eyes snap open. Ripley's point of view as the beast mounts her coffin. Terminal nightmare. Angle on Ripley. No! <laughs> Her hands claw frantically at the smooth curve of the plastic canopy. The remaining Marine, crazy with adrenaline and terror, unleashes his flamethrower. The first alien and Ripley's capsule vanish in the napalm fireball. The Marine spins, screaming incoherently, and the liquid fire hoses the second alien, which drops its victim and falls burning to the deck. The vault is an inferno. Ripley's capsule is sagging, melting. Dissolve to interior medic lab surgical. A scorched hypersleep capsule is wheeled in under brilliant lamps. The waiting crisis team plunges biomonitor leads and a hissing air supply line into sockets on the capsule. A technician with a small handheld power saw begins to cut away the heat crazed canopy. Hands and surgical gloves lift the canopy away. Ripley lies curled in a tight fetal knot. Interior med lab quarantine, a small white room, a white bed surrounded by medical gear, Hicks in his underwear, is hunched on the edge of the bed, impatiently smoking a cigarette. The dressings on his head and shoulder have been changed spend senders. She wears a biohazard envelope over, of, over coveralls, bubble goggles, a transparent filter mask. You know you can't smoke in here. Yes, ma'am. Takes a puff. I'm Spence. I'm not a medic. I'm from the tissue culture lab. I have to get a sample. She opens a small white case and takes out a gleaming cylinder. Uh, just stick your thumb in here. Hicks gives her a hard look, inserts his thumb. She touches a stud. Snick. He winces, looks ruefully at his thumb. Sorry. You're the last one? The others. Ripley, Newt, they came through okay? Who's Newt? The kid. Oh, Rebecca. Rebecca's fine. Ripley. 
Ripley's fine, Hex. Bishop. Where's Bishop? Bishop? The android. There were three of you. Three I know of anyway. Maybe you should try to sleep now. Hmm? You, want, you want the nurse? They can give you something. Why haven't I been debriefed? Where's the brass? Look, all I know is we've all been sleeping short hours since your ship came in, soldier. A crash from the corridor. A pained bellow and Newt scuttles in wearing a hospital gown. She backs into the corner as a largely large orderly rushes in, clutching his right hand. Like Spence, he wears biohazard gear. God damn it. She bit me. He starts for Newt. Hicks comes off the bed like he's mounted on springs. Handcocked for a train blow, the orderly backs off. Where's Ripley? Where is she? She's asking you a question. You looking to get yourself sedated, Corporal? Where is she? Now I'm asking you the question. Spence yanks her mask down in a reflexive, very human gesture. Moves slowly towards Newt, extending her hand. Rebecca, Newt, honey, it's okay. Ripley's going to be okay. Come on now. I'll take you. You can see her. Spence, there, there's no way. He moves to stop them, but Hicks takes a very deliberate step forward. Interior med lab, another room. Ripley lies in a coma, monitored by assorted white consoles. Her forehead is taped with half a dozen small electrodes. Newt, expressionless, walks slowly to the bedside as Hicks and Spence look on. She's sleeping. Sometimes people need to sleep to get over things. Newt looks up at a monitor that displays Ripley's EEG, watches the jitter of peaks and valleys. Is Ripley dreaming? I don't know, honey. Better not to. Exterior Rodina, the UPP station, various angles, smaller than anchor point. Interior cybernetics lab, close on Bishop. He stares straight ahead, the corner of his mouth twitching mechanically. Pull back. Bishop's torso is mounted to the center of a large square platform. Tubes and wires snake from his uh, ruined lower rib cage. The walls of the lab are lined with monitor screens and printers. Information is being reamed out of the Android at high speed. Printouts of measurements, graphs, formulas. Colonel Dr. Suslov is beside the Vietnamese commando who wears a sleeveless fatigue blouse revealing regimental tattoos. A yin yang, hash marks, and ID marker like the supermarket barcode. They watch as graphics programs generates a detailed anatomical drawing of a face hugger on a large monitor. She says something short and emphatic in Vietnamese and repeats it. Yes. And this? He taps the keyboard and the face hugger vanishes. The screen begins to draft an alien and side and frontal projections. No. On the slab, the robotic tick still works in the corner of Bishop's mouth. Interior cargo lock. The two technicians in biohazard gear squat on either side of Bishop's legs. An electronic microscope has been set up on a low tripod. A small monitor displays magnified skin and a few dark lobules. The one technician extracts the ultrafine probe from its sterile package and leans forward. You're getting tape of this, Miller? Bet your ass. Orders. That's good because I swear I just saw a piece of this shit move. On the monitor, the tip of the probe trembles, brushes one of the globules. The second tech takes it, inserts it in a plastic tube, seals the tube in small metal canister, writes number 17 on the side in red grease pen. Since when do androids get diseases? I don't know. Sure looks like something got to this poor bastard. Interior Rossetti's office cubicle. Colonel Rossetti, Colonel Marines, is Anchor Point's head of military operations. His office is furnished in the best future Pentagon style. Imitation Rosewood Division insignia plaques, a desktop model of the dropship from Aliens. Rossetti glances up from his monitor as his secretary enters, a young woman in semi-dressed Marine uniform. Wells and Fox, Colonel. Military Science. Weapon Division. Rosetti eyes the envelope with evident distaste, scrawls his signature in the required box before opening it, removes documents, hands the empty envelope back. Show them in. Secretary exits. Rosetti's point of view close up on two plastic microfinch cards, each with front and side views of Fox and Wells, 
retinal ID images, scaled down fingerprints, etc. Stamped Milicy Weapons Division. Kevin Fox, Colonel. Rossetti point of view Fox is tanned, athletic, hyper confident. His smile, a heartless display of state of the art enamel bonding techniques. Wells is just behind him. Susan Wells. Same spa tuned look, same expensive casual wear. Welcome to Anchor Point. Fox and Wells seat themselves without waiting to be asked. We're impressed, Colonel. Susan and I are definitely impressed. The videos don't really give you an idea of the scale, do they? She might as well be talking about a tour of Notre Dame. But we're particularly impressed with your handling of the situation, the situation so far. We're impressed with your cooperation. We call it following orders. Yes, it would simplify things if everyone did, wouldn't it? Particularly the civilian component of the deck squad. I think we may have a potential security problem there. We've been going over psych profiles, Colonel. Anchor Point seems to be kind of a project that attracts idealists. Liberals. Let's just say we've noted a certain antipathy to military science, Colonel. A certain lack of sympathy with the goals of the weapons division. Anchor Point is under Colonel administration authority. This isn't a military operation. If we were here, we'd be in a violation of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. It looks great on paper, Colonel, but we want the civilians who boarded uh, Sulaco uh, sewn up tight. Forfeit agreements for starts. Anyone talks, they lose their shares. We found it reasonably effective in most cases. But that's a simple matter. Th this isn't Sulaco's data database indicates a boarding operation en route, Colonel. A boarding operation? Why wasn't I informed? We're informing you. You seem to have lost an android, Colonel. The Union of Progressive Peoples have Bishop. Dissolve to interior anchor point entrance to anti-bugging bubble. A Marine ushers Hicks into a large bare chamber. Hicks wears his dress uniform. The room is dominated by the bubble, a mirrored sphere. This way, Corporal. The Marine leads Hicks up a gangway. Hicks enters the bubble. The Marine closes the door behind him. Interior of the bubble, three members, Rosetti, Trent, Schumann of Anchor Point's directorate are seated at the round table. With them are Fox and Wells. Hicks comes to the attention and salutes. At ease, Hicks, be seated. My name is Rosetti, stations military attache. For my right, Trent, exobiology, Schumann, diplomatic corpse. From your right. I'm Kevin Fox, Hicks. This is Susan Wells, we're with the company. We'd like, to, we'd like to congratulate you on your successful mission. Successful? I lost my squad in that hole. You but you returned, return. Corporal. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. You returned, Corporal. And you rescued the colony's sole survivor. We've all read the transcript of your debriefing, Hicks. Where's Bishop, sir? If you don't mind, Hicks, we'll table that until. I've read the transcript. Are you certain, Hicks, that you have nothing more to tell us about the alien's life cycle? Detail, Hicks. Detail is crucial. Trent, the subject is classified. Corporal Hicks' security rating needs to be upgraded before we can. I've already told you everything I know. Hicks. Let the corporal have his way, Colonel. After all, he's seen these creatures in action. You ordered the subject classified maximum security, Fox. I seriously doubt that Corporal Hicks knows anything more than he's already told us, which is a very great pity. But the android bishop was designed for scientific observation. A Hyperdyne model, A5, a walking data bank. Corporal Hicks asked the right question to begin with. To answer your question, Hicks, we aren't certain. But we can guess, can't we, Colonel? Where? Regina Station. The UPP? What's the UPP got to do with this? The LACO's navigation systems failed. You were in disputed to territory for something over 85 minutes, Hicks. The UPP would have or ordinarily respond to that as a violation of their space. So far, there's been no protest. Nothing. The LACO's computer indicates a co covert aborting operation. Indicates.
Oh, that's me too. To put it in a diplomatic terms, Hicks, they've got our ass in a sling. If they want to regard Salako incident as a hostile act, and let me assure you that they will eventually, they can compromise our position in the current round of arms reduction talks. We're talking serious ramification here. Then we have the communication lag to, to and from Earth. A week either way. So we're looking at a 14 day wait for policy clarification. We have a major crisis on our hands. We arrived with a policy brief, Schumann, and you've seen it. We're here to implement that brief. And your orders predate knowledge of UPP involvement. We're here to do our job, Colonel. In this case, doing your job might involve distinct possibility of precipitating nuclear war. Any further questions for the corporal? No, in that case, Hicks. Sir. Hicks stands, salutes. Interior anchor point, r and zone, the mall. Tully slopes along looking for Haggard in space. He wears his trademark jacket. The mall is across between a Hyatt atrium and an airport shopping concourse. Shops, vegetation, fast food outlets, a bar. He arrives at what are apparently elevator doors. The doors open on a miniature subway car. Tully steps in and the doors close. Interior tissue culture lab. Spence is working with cultures. Her arms are up to the elbows in a pair of white gloves mounted in round openings on the side of a transparent plastic tank. She looks up as Tully enters. Hey. You look like homemade shit. What happened down here, Tully? There's some kind of security blackout on. Yeah, and I'm part of it. I can't tell you anything. I had to sign a whole new set of papers. Talk to anybody and I lose my shares. All my shares, right? You joking, Tully? Wish I was. What's the old man got for me to dick around with for, with this shift? She crosses to a lab bench and takes something from a white wire basket. Here, all yours. Orders are, use the manipulators for this. She hands him something wrapped in a sheet of white printout held with a rubber band. He removes the band, unrolls the paper. The canister, number 17. What the hell did happen on the ship, Tully? How, can, how come all the biopsy work on those three and this very quiet, sudden backlog of autopsy material, how come it's all triple classified? What's going on? We, we, had, we had these two spooks from Gateway in here today acting like they just bought the place. Okay, okay, but later, okay? Not here. Dissolve to interior tissue culture lab. Tully at the controls of a pair of high-tech servo manipulators visible through the thick glass of an ultra heavy duty rectangular tank. The controls are gloves. A cable leads from the wrist of each glove to the face of the tank. Tully moves his hands, testing. The skeletal steel waldos inside the tank mimic each move. He uses them to open the canister, removes the probe, an electronic microscope is built into the tank. It's monitor mounted just above the window. He positions the probe's, probe's tip under the microscope. Angle over the top of monitor for his reaction. Spence, what is this? Where did it come from? Spence strolls up behind him with a cup of coffee, a pen tuckered behind her ear. Come on, Charlie, don't you read the spec sheets anymore? It's off, it's off the shop, off your transport. It's God. Spence's point of view close on the monitor. The tip of the probe is encased in a sheet of glittering black filigree. Angle on Spence. Up the res. Tully taps a, a lap board. Magnification increases by 20 powers. Extreme close-up monitor as the screen fills with a large image that might be a bizarre landscape, its lines and textures recalling the interior of the derelict ship in Alien. Dissolve to interior eco module. An experimental pocket Eden, a half acre of artfully ragged concrete Disney landed into lush rainforest, sun dappled miniature meadows, patches of Af African cactus. Newt crouches in long grass, her hand extends towards a small animal, a lemur. Hicks stands nearby. Have you been there, Hicks? Africa? Morocco, four weeks of basic, but that was mountains, not like this. Lemur scoots away. Spooked by his voice, Newt watches it as it scurries up a tree. I'd like to go there. No problem. You're going to Gateway Station on Sulaco, right? 
Then you catch a shuttle down and you're in Oregon. Just to jump over a puddle to Africa once you're there. Spence walks out of the miniature jungle carrying a white wire tray of samples and plastic lab bottles. I don't remember them. Your grandparents? Yep, nods. Well, I guess they remember you, sure. But what if Ripley wakes up and I'm not here? Can I wait? Hey, she'll know where you're going, right? Anyway, Salako is the only ship back to Gateway for two months. But look, you want to make double sure? Then you leave her a map exactly where you're going. Spence grins at Hicks. Interior Newt Storm Cubicle. Newt at a fold down desk at work in an elaborate multicolored felt pin star map. A dotted line zigzags from Anchor Point to Portland, Oregon. She carefully prints her new address. New Jordan, care of Mr. and Mrs. Richard Jordan, 34877 Greenleaf Avenue, number 582, New Portland, Oregon. Interior Med Lab, Ripley's room. Ripley, Juan, and, and comatose, Hicks waits awkwardly in the doorway, dangling new snapsack as she enters and tapes the finished star map to the wall, the first thing Ripley would see, waking. Newt beside the bed, looking down at her friend. Ripley? Ripley, it's Newt. Hey, we gotta go. I'm gonna go stay with my grandparents in Oregon. Hicks says it's a good place. Anyway, there's there's a map for you, Ripley, and, and how to get there. You can come there and stay with me, okay? You have to, okay? Tears on her cheeks as Hicks puts his hand on her shoulder and they leave the room. Interior departure bay. Newton Hicks amid a bustle of power loaders, assorted robot vehicles. They approach the entrance to a narrow corridor. Sign departure bay, crew only beyond this point. That's you. I know. Good luck in Oregon. He holds the red knapsack as she slips into the straps. Hicks. Yeah? She looks at him, ghost of a grin. She gives him the thumbs up sign. Affirmative. He returns the same. Affirmative. She turns and makes her way up the narrow boarding corridor. It's long, tapers to nothing. Tiny figure receding, bright dot of the knapsack. She turns and waves. He waves back. She's gone. Exterior anchor point. Sulaco pulls away, begins to accelerate, dwindles against the stars. Dissolve to interior Rodina conference chamber. Cigarette smoke drifts above the long, narrow table in a narrow space. A half dozen ranking technocrats are jammed along either side in folding chairs with Colonel Dr. Suslov at the head. Obviously, Colonel Doctor, the purpose of their mission was to obtain specimens of this life form. The android dissected a single specimen, one of the pre-larva forms, like that uh, thing that killed Lenko. And you believe that these creatures are of potential military importance? Yes, provided it's possible to clone the alien spores recovered from the alien skin and clothing. Uh, with the goal of programming these machines for use as weapons. The adult form, Colonel Doctor, is evidently a killing machine of great strength, extraordinary sophistication. No evidence of intelligence, purely instinctual. Our sources in the corporate corporationist infrastructure are aware of the existence of a special project within the Wayland Utani's weapons division. We have been unable to penetrate <laughs> penetrate their security. The intelligence officer suggests that this special project concerns the alien. I remind you, Colonel Doctor, that we experiment with the alien genetic material only if we are prepared to violate primary biological warfare limitations in the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. And I remind the diplomatic officer that the Whalen yutani Corporation is obviously prepared to do so, that they may already be doing so. As ever, our level of technology lags slightly behind that of the capitalist cartels. But now, by chance... By chance? You refer to the proven bravery and constant initiative of our people's commando division. Not at all, Major. Their courage is unquestioned. Nonetheless, consider, we are in possession of a potential weapon, 
a whole new technology, if you will, which Weyland Yutani clearly intends to develop. We are in, as you might put it, on the ground floor. But it's only if we choose to be, if we choose to hold our advantage. I agree. We have no choice but to proceed. And I go on record as strongly advising that the android be returned to anchor point. Are our technicians capable of repairing the thing? Repairing it? Why? You lack a sense of the importance of gesture, Braun. Let us avoid their customary accusations of, of barbarism and buy ourselves time. Our technicians will repair the thing, return it to them, and we will proceed. We will clone the alien. Interior anchor point, tissue, tissue culture lab. Trent, head of biolab, Rossetti, and Fox wait seated as Tully wheels a holographic display module into position. The lights dim. A faint ghostly cube shimmers in front of the three men. Initially, this was merely routine, you understand. We attempted to determine its compatibility with terrestrial DNA. What kind of DNA exactly, Doctor? Human, of course. Something shivers and takes from the cube of light, a double helix threaded with green and red beads of light. Uh, watch closely, please. The alien genetic material looks like a cubist vision of an Art Deco staircase, its asymmetrical segments glowing day glow green and purple. That's a biological structure? More like a part of a machine. The alien form makes contact with human DNA. The transformation is shockingly swift, but its stages can still be followed. The thing seems to pull itself into and through the coils. For an instant, the two are meshed, locked, and then the final stage. A new shape glows, a hybrid. The green and red beads have been altered beyond recognition. Like a high-speed viral takeover. What's real-time duration on this, Trent? That was it. What you see, that's what you get. That's how fattest it is. Interior anchor point machine shop. Hicks enters the cavernous shop, dodging out of the way of emerging power loader. The place is an uh, oily forest of steel, machines of various kinds of weight of repair. Walker's at a workbench, a big man in a grease-stained vest. Hicks, temporary duty assignment. Walker works the joystick on a handheld remote control unit. An unmanned power loader comes to life and lumbers towards the bench. He brings it to a halt expertly, exactly where he wants it, with few casual twiddles of the stick. Walker, know how to blow out the hydraulic lines on a force feed si uh, feedback system? No. Never too late to learn. He offers Hicks a cigarette, lights it for him with a micro torch from the bench. You off the mystery ship, Hicks? Sulaco. So, <clears throat> What's the mystery? A popular question. Whole thing's triple classified now, and word's getting around that two of the deck party never came back. I was uh, iced. Sure. You ready to show me this feedback system? Anytime. Interior ops room. Panel on Jackson's multi screen array and operations. Video images of various anchor point locales. Space suited figures and robot welders making routine hull repairs. High angle the mall, a buzzer sounds, screen directly in front of Jackson displays, incoming transmission source, UPP Rodina, diplomatic encrypt, Dipl Corpse Schumann. Jackson, <laughs> Jackson bobs her head, moving the cursor cap to various windows on the screen. Sorry, <coughs> COVID man, kidding. Somebody find me Schumann, uh, tell me, or tell him we got incoming Rodina coded standard diplomatic. His opposite number must have decided it's time for the weekly bullshit session. Interior anti-bugging bubble. Schumann is seated alone at the round table. A miniature video camera is set up on the table. Opposite him is a large wall screen displaying an image of the UPP diplomatic officer, also alone, seated in the far end of the narrow table in the Rodina conference room. Androids, by law, are afforded the status of persons, citizens, under your system, yes, we prefer to afford them the status of machines. But you're holding one of our citizens captive. The, the citizen in question, the synthetic bishop, 
has been held in regard to a treaty violation involving an armed vessel. But Sulaco was homing on Anchor Point. The so-called violation was a result of a malfunction. That matter is under investigation. But I repeat, you are holding one of our citizens. But the incident is also being investigated with regard to an apparent violation of the Strategic Arm Reduction Treaty. Sulaco weapon systems fall entirely within the prescribed, but I refer to those sections of the treaty concerned with biological warfare. A beat. The UPP diplomat has just scored, but Schumann maintains his poise. The allegation is false, but we have no official allegations at this time. The matter remains under investigation. Bishop, however, of no further use in the inquiry, we are returning him to you. Exterior anchor point, shuttle bay, a UPP shuttle. Docking, the bay closes behind it. Voiceover, static voices of anchor point docking crew. Interior shuttle bay, Schumann and two Marines enter the bay. They wear biohazard envelopes, masks. They shuttle, the shuttle's hatch opens and the Vietnamese commando steps out. Bishop emerges. He looks at the commando, then at Schumann and the Marines waiting at the bottom of the gangway. The commando gestures, go. You're under quarantine orders, Bishop. Escort him to the med lab. Interior of the mall. Hicks has just come off shift. The mall's bar catches his eye. The facade says it all. Ye old prepackaged, genuine simulated wood grain generic tavern and the only joint in town. Inside the bar, one wall is screen showing a stale rerun of a Brazilian soccer match. Some of the customers play hologram game consoles. Tully is seated at the bar. Hicks takes a stool beside him. Beer. He finishes his dog, fishes his dog tags out and detaches one, passes it to the bartender. Bartender inserts it in the terminal, rings the beer, and hands it back. Your Hicks. Sulaco? Tully in his trademark jacket is obviously drunk. Who are you? Tully? <sighs> Tech 5, Tissue Lab, the fucking N.A. Jesus. Slacko, Lucky. Lucky? Who? Are you lucky, man? You! You're Lun Lucky, son of a bitch, Hicks! Knocks back his drink. Uh, how's that? All that way, all that way. Back here with those, those fucking things, man. Tully has just gotten his sudden undivided attention. Things? What things? Shit. We had to sign all the all of us. Lose our fucking shares. We tell anyone, right? They were on the ship. Yeah, Jesus. I saw him. He reaches for his glass, but it's empty. Where? How many? When? Look, I... B bad place to talk. I, I gotta go. Now, leave! You aren't going anywhere, buddy. Tully, suddenly angry, not so much at Hicks, at his own situation. I didn't come out here to work on shit like that. Came out here to help design ecosystems, but not build designer germs for the next year. You want an earful? I got it. Shift after next. Place called DP54 Level 7 Map. Can't can't talk here. He twists out of Hicks' grip into the crowd. Hicks sits at the bar, staring at his untouched beer. Dissolve to interior of the bubble, Rosetti, Trent, Fox, and Wells. And Bishop has agreed to undergo complete physical and chemical analysis. He requested it for himself. Results? No irregularities so far. No trace of the alien cellular material. Tampering, then. Reprogramming. Any new circuits in our Mr. Bishop? Any little surprises courtesy of the UPP? No, nothing. And his data on the alien, all there? Intact? Yes, it seems to be, but if his memory's been tampered with, we'd have no way of knowing. Neither would he. In any case, we have to assume that the UPP accessed Bishop's memory. That they have that data. They may also have specimens of the alien genetic material. 
In other words, you want to get in with your brief, don't you? You weren't trying to clone the cultures and you didn't want Schumann at this meeting. This isn't a question of diplomacy, Colonel Rossetti. Isn't it a violation of SAR treaty? Well, has anyone mentioned military applications, Colonel? Trent? No. I think a very nice case can be made here for applied exobiology. We do have a standing order to study alien life forms when we encounter them. Preliminary analysis of the material from Sulaco reveals a remarkable adaptive capacity, the potential for cancer research alone. Imagine, Colonel, if it can be programmed to only kill cancer cells. What exactly is it you propose to do, Trent? Well, we'll nurse the, the cells in stasis tubes under consent and observation. Uh, we'll terminate them before they become embryos. I see. Cancer research. And our motives are exclusively humani humanitarian, is it? Colonel, when Wells gets his reply from Earth, priority will go to military development of the alien. We know that because we know where our orders came from. The decision has already been made. And potential UPP research in the same direction only adds to the urgency, Colonel. The decision rests with me. Perhaps you misunderstood, Rosetti. The decision has been made. They won't just break you, Colonel. They'll see to it that it's as though your career never happened. They're top people. They can do that. And you know it. Rosetti, with a long, cold look for both of them, he got the message. Schumann, of course. We'll have to be informed. Of course. Cancer research. Interior med lab scan unit. Bishop patiently undergoes a scan. He lies on his back on a narrow support as a massive donut-shaped sensor moves down the length of his body. A life-size color scan image is displayed on a large screen, his organs. Oh, the knees. Looks like they do the joints in polycarbon. How about the bishop? Knees okay? Yes. Tentative smile. Polycarbon won't hold up where the dam. Interior Rodina bio labs, smaller than the anchor point lab. Equipment looks less advanced. The only light is a yellowish glow from a stasis tube. Braun and two assistants are clustered around the tube, observing the things suspended there. Thumb-sized, grayish pink, an embryo. Interior anchor point, a tunnel at the edge of the construction zone. Hicks jogs through the tunnel. Its brightly lit arc of white ceramic recalls London tube stations. But the floor is paved smooth and black with freshly painted traffic symbols. He passes a woman jogging in the opposite direction and keeps going. Small video cameras are mounted at interval intervals overhead, panning slowly from side to side. As he continues, less of the tunnel is finished. Sections of tile are missing, revealing pipes, wiring, structural steel. Past a certain point, he's jogging the raw steel tube, splashing through the shallow puddles of condensation, fewer lights, widely spaced. He reaches a junction and pauses and chooses a tunnel. Interior construction zone chamber, high, long shot, Hicks. Comes out of the lit mouth of a tunnel, the space enters the size of a football stadium, but dark and industrial, industrially gothic. Stacks of whole plate and geodesic struts, a shower of sparks as he passes a robot welder, a la the machine in the opening sequence of Aliens. Down an aisle of material and heavy machinery, Spence is waiting. Hicks? She's in the shadows, smoking a cigarette. You, huh? Why you? I work in the lab at Tully. Couldn't make it. Hangover? Scared. A forfeit agreement he had to sign. Doesn't scare you? I haven't signed. Not yet. They've only given them to the ones who saw that happen. Why you? It's always okay, Hicks. I know him. Believe it or not, he doesn't scare that easy. He told me what was on that ship. What he saw. You know what it was. I don't think anybody knows who it is. They've got us growing the stuff. We've been running recombinant DNA routines on it using human genetic material. You've been what? Cancer research. Tully says they, it's just a cover. Says it's like trying to cure cancer with a shotgun. Anyway, everybody knows those two spooks from Gateway are 
multi milisai. Box and wells. Weapons division. Not even supposed to exist these days, not officially anyway. I still don't see why you're telling me this. Maybe I don't either. It's just I've got to tell somebody. Now there's a room rumor some somebody came in on UPP ship today. Somebody off Soako. Bishop. I don't know. Maybe progressive peoples will get their own alien too. Maybe they'll grow some. Shit. You'd better hope not. Why's that? Their lab gears five years behind ours. They'd never be able to control it. Think you can, huh? I don't know. Interior ops room. A bleep as Tully appears on one of Jackson's screens, looking up at a camera in the tissue culture lab. Give me some maintenance people down here, will ya? We wanna check on the stasis system. Pressure differential's off and the read keeps fluctuating. And punch a priority, Trent will cover it. Sure, uh, you want a piece of the Super Bowl, Tully? Nah. Denver. Denver? No way. Give me a 10th in Chicago. Interior Rodino Biolab. Ron is seated at a computer entering data. Seslov is staring into the stasis tube containing the de developing alien. There's an irony in this. Irony, Colonel Doctor? The readiness with which it lends itself to genetic manipulation, Braun. The speed with which its cells multiply. Yes. Remarkable. As though the gene structure had been designed for ease of manipulation. And this apparently universal compatibility with other plasmas. And you find this ironic? Ironic that we are attempting to program it as a weapon, yes. How is that? Perhaps it is the fruit of some ancient experiment, a living artifact, the product of genetic engineering, a weapon. Perhaps we are looking at the end result of yet another arms race. A defeatist attitude, Colonel Doctor. Our project can only strengthen the union of progressive peoples. Close the stasis tube, a chest burster. It's suspended there like an eyeless fetal dolphin. Ew. Interior machine shop. Hicks alone in the shop, mechanically going through the motions of the busy work he's been assigned to keep him out of the way. It's quite a piece of machinery, Corporal Hicks. That's what we used to say about you. How the hell are you, Bishop? Brass said you were snatched by the UPP. How are things in the socialist paradise? I was returned. I assumed they had no further use for me. He moves among the silent machines, touching them as he speaks. There are rumors, Hex, that Weapons Division intends to develop the alien. Where'd the bastard get one, Bishop? One of them managed to board Salako, Hex. Ripley killed it. Good for her. She called it the Queen. It was larger than the others, very large. I somehow he deposited genetic material in the ship. Then they're stone crazy, man. I hear the UPP might try it themselves. Given the current state of the arms race, it's entirely possible. I'm programmed to protect human life, Hicks. It's my nature. Everything I am, everything I know tells me this experiment must be aborted. Yeah, I know the feeling. But I can't be entirely certain that you can trust me, Hicks. You can't what? The UPP may have reprogrammed me. I've been thoroughly examined, of course, but the possibility does exist. Wouldn't you know? No. I may be functioning as an enemy agent. Well, what the hell? We have to kill it, don't we? I have to try. I'm in, man. And I think I know we can find us a little help. Dissolve to interior t tissue culture lab. Tully and Spence are alone. You want coffee? I'm going to the machine. No. He peers into one of the stasis tubes. A small ovoid of tissue is suspended there. Maintenance, maintenance cure your pr uh, pressure differential problem? Said there wasn't any. Said it was a glitch. Didn't want to get his hands dirty? It settled down by itself. Spence exits, totally moves closer to the tube. Close on the single developing spore. Inside, it looks like a much smaller version of the alien egg. Wider angle on toy. Hey there. Hiya. How you doing? 
nutrient solution agreeing with you? We're looking lots bigger today, aren't we? You bet. Terrific. Just awesome. Fucking wonderful. His monologue is interrupted by Wells' entrance. He's startled, looks up guiltily. The heavy glass doors hiss shut behind her. Beginning with nature, Tully? You're not wearing a badge. White strip registers contamination. Turns red if you're accidentally exposed to something. Got it? Where's Trent? Lunch. And how's our friend? She moves to the stasis tube and looks in. Friends. Our little friends. Growing. Give me hard copy for the past six hours. Sorry. Ask Trent. I don't think you understand me, Technician Tully. She's following him as he nears the main computer console. In the background, a stasis tube begins to hiss, cracks loudly, a hairline fissure emits from a superfine spray of fluid. An alarm sounds. What does the... Oh, Jesus. Two of the tubes blow out. Nutrient fluid and plastic shards everywhere. Wells and Tully go down. A louder alarm cuts in. Red light strobe. Locks in the doors. Uh, thunk shut. An automated... Uh, automatic containment measure as Spence outside throws down her coffee and begins to struggle with the door controls, trying to reach Tully. Tully, face down in a pool of fluid, sees that he's nine inches from the gray pigeon's egg of alien tissue. His eyes widen. He gets to his knees as carefully as he can, reaches slowly, slowly, sideways, manages to snag a pair of plastic tongs and shallow lab tray from the counter. Wells tries to scramble to her feet, loses her balance on a slippery goop and snatches it at his arm. He nearly falls on top of the thing, but cuffs her roughly away, kneels, tongs poised, a beat. Tiny orifice opens. For a split second, something glitters above the thing, a faint fist-sized cloud of dark mist. Then it's gone, and Tully's moving, swooping in with tongs and tray. Tully, Tully, God damn it! what's happening? Are you okay? Decon, get us down to Decon! Wells is struggling to her feet. Interior decontamination shower. Drenched, naked, furious, Wells is nearly invisible behind a scalding downpour as Texan biohazard gear scrub her down with detergents and antibacterial agents. She shoots eye daggers at Tully, who is being worked over by two more techs. Dissolve to interior ops room. Jackson at work, pan across screens to security camera view of DNA lab. Clean now, but minus two stasis tubes. Image identified. Tissue culture, 25 August, 1900 hours, 15 seconds. Jackson's attention is elsewhere. Interior, a corridor. Hicks keeps watch as, a bishop, bishop op as Bishop opens a panel, exposing complex wiring. No hesitation whatsoever as he strips two wires, removes a Walkman-sized VCR from his belt, and clips leads to the stripped wires. Interior, ops room. Close on monitor image of the lab. The picture fuzzes out, scrambles, returns, but now it reads, tissue culture, 23 August, 1,200 hours, two seconds, and the missing tubes are back in place. Interior entrance, outside lab. You have three minutes at the outside. Go. Bishop punches the code sequence and the door hisses open. They're through, moving. Interior tissue culture lab. They move down a row of stasis, stasis tubes. Bishop pauses when they reach the two units missing tubes, then quickly moves on. He opens a wall panel exposing controls and a large, very serious looking red switch. Label above switch. Stasis system microwave sterilization. Then he hesitates. Turning slowly as if under compulsion, he looks back. The line of glowing tubes. Do it. And still he doesn't move. Hicks darts his arm past Bishop, breaking the trance and yanking the red switch. A burst of unpleasant high frequency sound as the fluid in the tubes instantly begins to boil. Close on one of the alien cultures. As it bursts. Distance disintegrates into the film of slime, lost behind the storm of bubbles. The lab's alarm going off. The doors slide open as three Marines cover Hicks and Bishop with handguns. Just don't, don't fucking, fucking move, move Jack. Jack. His, Hicks stone faces the Marines, then cracks a grin. Interior detention unit. Hicks and Bishop in white plastic medical restraints, like arm and leg irons, precede the grimaced faced Marines along a corridor and are thrown into separate cells. Dissolve to interior of the bubble. Meeting of anchor points full directorate, including Wells and Fox, Jackson, a number of new faces. Wells is white lipped with fury. They knew the code, didn't they? Code for the door. You got it, Ops. And they knew just where to go and which button to push 
to poach your eggs for us, didn't they? Struggling with an idea ops? Think it may even have an, been an inside job? You're a great A company prick, aren't you, mister? Yep. Her bitch truck driver's side, a tough lady. He was taking a lot of life or death responsibility in her job. Love her. The, an the anchor point phase of the project is terminated, Rosetti. You'll keep Hicks and the android in solitary until they can return us to Gateway to stand trial for treason. The anchor point phase? Uh, what do you mean? We have no more material to work with. You have no material to work with, Trent. In any case, it's become obvious that you aren't quite the man for the job. We took the precaution of obtaining our own samples. They're on their way to Gateway. And everything, every move each of you have made since our arrival is going to be gone over with a fine tooth. As Wells begins to stammer, her eyes betray a terrible consternation. She half rises from her chair, lurches forward, catching herself in her hands. The phases into chattering palsy as thick strand of blood streaked drool descends towards the table. Fox seated to her left is instinctively shoved his own chair back, ready to run. Everyone else is frozen with shock. As the chittering toothbrew comes a shrill a shriek in human rage, the transformation takes place. Segmented biomechanoid bio tendons squirm beneath the skin of her arms. Her hands claw at one another, tearing redundant tissue from alien talons. Then the shriek dies, she straightens up and rips her face apart in a single movement. The glistening claws coming away with the skin, eyes, muscle, teeth, splinters of bone, sound of ripping claw. The new beast sheds its human skin in a single sinuous bloody ripple molting on fast forward. An instant of utter silence as the featureless mass moves from side to side, scanning. Trent vomits explosively. The Marine guard snatches his pistol from his holster and fires wildly across the table, blind screaming chaos. Mm -hmm. Overhead shot as the directorate plunges like a single panicked organism to the far side of the bubble. The thing is on Fox before he can get up from his chair. Close on his scream as the sucking fang tongue plunges through the orbit of his eye. Angle, a Marine on, with a flamethrower bursts through the door, torching Fox with a new beast, setting fire to the bubble's acoustic foam baffles. Interior corridor outside Tully's sleeping cubicle. Spence is coming down the corridor, carrying a clear plastic bag of styrofoam food containers. Nobody else in sight. She looks tired, but not particularly worried. She reaches the door to his cubicle, thumps on it with the heel of her hand. Tully, hey, open up. I got you some food. No reply. She thumps again, then punches the combination. The lock looks like a telephone keypad. The door opens, it's dark inside. Tully, you sleeping? Interior Tully's sleeping cubicle. She climbs in, dark, very. A red LED glows on the phone console. She crawls through the, the detritus of Tully's housekeeping and fumbles for the lights. Can't find the switch. Tully? Lights click on, nobody's there. Nothing. Looks even messier than she last saw it. She sighs, puts the bag of food on a ledge, scoops a mound of dirty clothes off the pillow in an automatic cleaning up gesture and sees Tully's lab badge, picks it up. Close on the badge, the contamination indicator strip is red. Dissolve to interior detention cell. Hicks sitting on the narrow bunk. The door opens. One of the Marines who arrested him in the lab. He wears combat armor now. What's your problem, bud? Got a war on? The Marine steps back, admitting a haggard Rossetti. Get up, Hicks. We need you in the ops room. We didn't kill it. No, it killed Fox and Wells. Interior tunnel construction zone. Small vehicle winds toward us through puddles of con condensation. A skeletal electric micro jeep with heavy roll bars, scratched and paint scarred. Walker dri driving, Hicks behind him in partial combat armor and communication rig, cradling a pulse rifle. Walker's pushing it, driving fast. The jeep bounces and sways, skitters around a corner, into the gloom of the big construction chamber. Halt. Give me a read. You're close. Hang a left. Is he moving? No. Walker swings the Jeep around as they roll towards the narrow gap between massive stacks of geodesic struts. 
Interior Ops Room. Jackson studies a simulator screen, a moving cursor. The Jeep navigates a 3D grid representation of the construction zone. Uh, now left again. The cursor turns, nears a blinking red dot. Spence, drawn and anxious, looks over Jackson's shoulder. Bishop and Rossetti are beside her. You sure it's him? It's his locator frequency, isn't it? No two alike. Surgically implanted, just like yours. He's not moving. Why would he go down there? Badge. He knew that he'd been infected. Scared? He's scared? Tully. Interior construction chamber, dark. The Jeep creeps along between stacks of prefab full units, emerges into an open space, junction of several corridors. The deck is an inch deep in water. He's there. You're right on top of him. Walker stops the Jeep. Hicks stands up, plays the gleam of flashlight around the area, presses the mute button on his headset. Tully. Tully, yo. Echo. Drip of water. Hicks clips the flashlight beneath the barrel of his gun and jumps down. Reflections ripple as he moves forward. Swings the beam along the surface. Something there. The logo patches down the sleeve of Tully's ruptured, blood-soaked leather jacket, drifting shreds of human tissue. Can you see him? Yeah. And the thing that was Tully launches itself from the top of one of the stacks of construction material, lands on top of the Jeep going for Walker through the roll bars. Close up on Jaws. Close up as the thing's tail lashes past Walker's face, taking a nick out of a steel bar. Close up on Walker's hands on the controls. A pair of levers, he yanks one back, shoves the other forward, thumbs both drive buttons simultaneously. Angle on the Jeep, separate drive trains for each wheel, pulls two 360s on a dime, hurling the thing towards Hicks. It smashes into a desk, splash of water, leaps for Hicks instantly. The charge from his pulse... Uh, pulse rifle takes it in midair, hideous Billy yellow spurt of acid, and it hits the water again with a terrific explosion of stream. The Jeep lurches out through the stream, uh, engines screaming, the wheels losing traction in the puddle, throwing up fantails of water, nearly overturning. Hicks jumps, snags a roll bar, empties the pulse rifle's clip into the seam, full auto as Walker hauls ass back down the corridor. Hicks, what's happening? Interior ops room. Hex! Hex! Close on screen as the Jeep cursor speeds away from Tully's blinking locator dot. Spence's eyes fixed on the screen as she makes a serious stab at swallowing her own fist. Dissolve to... Dissolve to interior Rodina Biolab. Very slow pan past monitors. One flickering like a defective strobe, the other displaying a readout in Russian. Past an overturned mug on a keyboard past assorted equipment, past the shattered ruin of the big stasis too, to Seslav and Braun cocooned in a glittering biomech structure of alien resin. Braun is dead, his rip cage gaping. Interior crew mess, screams and the hammer of automatic weapons. Station crew fleeing in panic, enter through one door, crash into tables, scattering trays and food, claw at one another to escape through another door. The Vietnamese commando and her partner are last into the room. They spin in unison and fire back through the door. Sound of rending metal and loud inhuman rage. The commandos scramble for the far door as the alien crashes into mess. A new form, the result of Suslod's genetic tinkering. Bigger, meaner, faster. Able to reproduce more quickly. The frantic crew are climbing a ladder. The commandos start up the ladder. They climb through a circular hatch. Like the deck they stand on, the hatch is made of heavy steel expansion grid. The alien swarms up the ladder and slams into the hatch just as the commandos close and lock it. The alien keeps on slamming. The steel begins to bulge and tear. Interior anchor point ops room. Hicks, Bishop, Rossetti, Schumann, and Jackson. <laughs> Can't raise them, boss. Try the diplomatic codes. <laughs> Diplomatic codes, they aren't responding to Mayday International. Maybe they've got a transponder down, but... Oh, hey, check this. Outgoing traffic. It's a squirt transmission. Military decryption. <laughs> what do they have in the area? 
not much automated mining system working in C313, uh, test module, a terraforming space operation and route MV45. Ooh, and uh, ooh, here we go. Uh, the battle cruiser Nikolai Stoiko, nine hours from Odina if they push it. What I want to know is what do we have in the area? Uh, not much. How about the Kansas City a Colonial Admin Transport? We hit her May Day. She'll get there inside 20 hours. Then what? We abandon the station. Destroy the station, man. We got nukes. Outlawed under the Strategic Arm Reduction Treaty. We can fiddle with the overrides on the fusion package. Baby Nova. Dealing with a new form, Colonel. We know nothing of this new mode of reproduction. Others may already have become hosts. What are you suggesting? In order to be entirely certain, Colonel, it would be necessary to override the fusion package now. Jackson looks up at Bishop. He's suggesting mass suicide. I thought you were programmed to protect human life. I'm taking the long view. Jackson's console chimes, begins to display new data, ID shots of three crew members. Uh, missing persons. Uh, two were members of the cleanup crew who did the lab after the blowout. Third doesn't check. No, wait. Lives was one of the first two, but that makes a total of 15. Something's happening. God damn it, Rosetti, it's catching. Midday, Kansas City, Jackson. What about Salako? It would take two days to raise her. With that shit on board. Gateway, Gateway will have our warning before Salako arrives. Oh, fine, Colonel. And who, who do you suppose would be willing to take it seriously? Weapons division? Hey, I, I'm getting something. The Socialist Space Brothers speak at last. Her main screen flickers and jumps. The speakers fill with a roar of static. Uh, their transmission standards get worse all the... She fa falls silent as the screen clears, revealing a young Slavic mad, mad woman, one of Seslav's lab assistants, in blood-drenched coveralls, jerky handheld video grainy transmission, indistinct background. She clutches a sheet of paper, reads aloud from it in a foreign language. Get a translation program online, Jackson. Jackson's already punching. An instantaneous computer translation cuts in his voiceover. The girl's lips move out of sync like a cheap dub. The translation is rendered in flat syn synth voice, close up on screen. Of Progressive Peoples, Technician First Class, Tatiana Malik. Please, we wish to inform you we have undertaken an experiment with genetic material obtained from the military transport vessel. We attempted to clone the xenomorph in stasis. Failure of the stasis system occurred in the 15th hour. Attempted modification of the genetic structure has resulted in a variant which replicates rapidly, more rapidly. It has taken most of us, those of us who remain, we wish to warn you, you must terminate any experiment with the material now. It is possible. It cannot be contained. There is no... The image flickers, vanishes. Angle on Jackson. God. Lost him. That, that's it. God damn it. She was just, just attack. Their brass didn't even bother. No brass left. You better check this, Hicks. Her other screens display assorted images of nearly identical tunnels and passageways, but three of them are black. She gestures to the dark screens. This, down, down by the main air scrubber. System says those three cameras still operational, but there's something in the way. Something big. Exterior anchor point eco module. Huge louvers pivot smoothly like the Venetian blinds, revealing lush vegetation through thick plastic. Interior, Spence sits across-legged in Newt's meadow, tearfully hugging a small, tame primate. 
Light crosses the meadow as the louvers open overhead, beyond the geodes. Essex. Artificial dawn, birds begin to sing, quiet before the storm. Exterior Rodina, no sign of movement. Interior, gear locker, dimly lit, clutter of spacesuits, machinery. The Vietnamese commando seated on the floor, back to the wall, cradling her gun. The corpse of her partner is sprawled on the back deck beside her, face hideously burned, his armor fretwork with acid, her face is blank, eyes straight ahead. Dissolve to exterior anchor point, the station. Interior med lab corridor, Hicks still in his fighting gear, walking purpose, purposefully. Med lab staff in hospital whites dubiously note his passage. Interior Ripley's room. Ripley comatose, still hooked up to assorted biomonitors, the only movement in the room, the restless flicker of a bank of colored diodes. Hick enters, crosses to the bed, seems about to speak, makes a helpless little gesture with his hands, then yanks the biometer, let, leads from the bedside console. The diodes go out, a buzzer begins to sound. The bed is mounted on casters. He starts to pull it out of the room, stops. He looks up at Newt's map on the wall. He rips the map from the wall and stuffs it into her hospital gown. Interior med lab corridor. Hicks hustles Ripley through med lab, not about to stop for anyone. Startled staff members jump out of the way. Interior anchor point, another corridor, entrance to a lifeboat. Signs and notices detailing lifeboat launches, launch procedures. Hicks lifts Ripley from the bed, carries her through the hatch into a lifeboat, places her in a hypersleep capsule, presses a button. The lid comes down, silent moment as he looks down at her through the lid, his palm on the smooth plastic in a gesture of farewell, resignation. Then back through the hatch where, the acti where he activates controls that seal the boat, setting the launch procedure in motion. Exterior hull section with row of lifeboats. Angle on the blunt prows of lifeboats proceeding around the curve of the station's hull. Interior lifeboat bay, Hicks watching digital countdown, muted wump of explosive bolts. Exterior lifeboats, flash of the bolts at Ripley's boat is launched into the sweep of night. Interior lifeboat bay, Bishop enters behind Hicks. Can you be certain she hasn't been infected? I'll take the chance. Why? I owe her one. Interior ops room. Jackson at her screens, screens display as before. The tunnels near the air scrubber with three screens dark. Close up on one tunnel view as an open six wheeled person. Close up on the tunnel view as an open six wheeled personnel carrier rolls past the video camera. Hicks looking up. Five Marines in full battle dress ride with him. Alsop, Greenfield, Bryce, Costello, Wallace. Next junction, hang a right. Interior tunnel, dim, light space far apart along the tunnel, the carrier takes a right. Uh, left of the fork and you'll want to take it slow. Uh, 50 meters to whatever's in front of that camera. Hicks gestures to Wallace, the driver. The carrier halts. Sound of the air scriber from down the tunnel. The Marines shift their weapons, uneasily eye the tunnel ahead. These are young recruits, not the hard case vets of aliens. Now listen up. We don't do this by the book. We don't pair off. Stay together, tight. Greenfield up front with me. Anything moves, you torch it. The rest of you, if it moves, kill it. You gotta get the fuckers before they get close. Now you know about the acid. You know they don't show on infrared. And you know you don't let them take you alive. You might have to do a friend a favor. Ready? Move out. He climbs down from the carrier, heavily burdened with gear. The others follow. Greenfield has a flamethrower. They move forward. Toward the next light, beyond it, the tunnel curves out of sight. You're right on top of it, Hicks. Right around the corner. Affirmative. They round the turn. Weapons ready and stop, stunned. What the? The tunnel, which widens here as it approaches the massive air scrubber, has been transformed. Its lights are dimly visible through shrouds of resin. Vast ribs of stuff sweep from the dim and monstrous shape that covers the deck at the base of the scrubber. We're looking into an alien grotto, black and pearlescent and obscene fairyland. The shape symmetry suggests function. Patient drumming of the air scrubber's giant fans. Scan it. Motion? Negative. Alsop, give me the flood. Alsop passes Hicks in portable halogen flood. Hicks thumbs it on. Holy Christ. The central shape is revealed as an enormous mutant queen. 
The thing is splayed at it on its back, mortared into the mass with resin, its vestig vestigial head towards Hicks and the Marines. Its abdomen is arched like an inverted scorpion tail tipped with a swollen, semi-translucent sac that ripples and pulses in the glare of Hicks' lamp, a biomechanical birth factory. Hold it. Steady. He kneels, unslings one of the gear cases, opens it, revealing a squat tube. Moving. Something's moving. Hicks is working on the tube thing, snapping components into place. Ray suddenly swings the beam away from the queen, revealing half a dozen new model aliens twisting out of recesses in the grotto walls. Interior ops room. Jackson and Bishop hear screams and firing over the comm link. The light! The goddamn light! Interior scrubber tunnel. The aliens tear into the marines like living chainsaws. Wallace and Costello go down immediately. The aliens begin to drag them away. Hicks has gotten a hold of the light, struggles to keep it on the queen as she props the tube against his thigh. Screams. Blue stutter of pulse rifles, a tongue of fire from Greenfield's flamethrower, flame, flame but alien jumps him. The Nepal stream arcs wildly, splashing the resin structure, and the queen wakes. The huge tail extends, lifts in the floodlight beam. Hicks is still trying to assemble his mortar. And as the swollen pod-like tail tip spits, open wide with a sticky tearing sound, releasing a puffball cloud of dark mist, we've seen it before, in miniature, with Tully in the lab, which begins to rise, drawn up toward the giant fans above the air scrubber, interior ops room. Stop the fans! Bishop is instantly on the case, leaning over Jackson's shoulder to punch the right buttons, but interior scrubber tunnel, it's too late. The cloud of spores is sucked into the fans as Hicks drops a shell into the mortar. It bucks against his thigh and the queen is blown to shreds, an explosion that rips the side of the scrubber. The vents. Seal the vents. Interior ops room. Bishop's fingers fly as he punches another sequence. In the vent, straight down the pipe, a long way to the whirling fans. Huge hermetics barriers slam across the vent in sequence. One, two, three. In the tunnel, Hicks scrambles to his feet. Out. Out of here now. The Marine beside him begins to spasm and quake as the change comes. Hicks shoots him in the chest close range and sprints for the carrier. Dissolve to interior Rodina hub. The Vietnamese commando nears the station's hub. The walls in one large chamber are decorated with official UPP art, like the blend of Mexican socialist Egypt prop murals and Sydney techno fantasy. She pays, passes evidence of brief violent struggle, a wall splashed with dry blood, a single shoe, smashed equipment, ragged acid scars on the deck. She looks like a child now, moving through all this small and alone, but not helpless. She still moves with a cat's wariness, her gun ready. Three face huggers scuttle across an intersection of corridors, tails thrashing. thrashing. She comes to a door that opens on Rodina's central hub, a large cylindrical space surrounding a core of equipment. The door is ajar, she edges through. Virtually the station's entire crew, perhaps a hundred people, have been cocooned along a multi-story column of vast relief of human bodies at glittering resin. She stares from a railing, appalled, then slips back through the door. Interior anchor point officer, Rosetti Jackson Bishop. I, I, I don't know what they did down there, but it's screwed up. Um, internal comlink for the whole area. I can't raise them. One of Jackson consoles chimes, the central screen suddenly glows with a high res simulation of Rodina. Rodina's got company. Exterior space, silent approach of the UPP cruiser, Nikolai Stoiko, a vicious looking mile long slab of airmen. Stoiko slows, comes to an ominous halt. Interior Rodina. The commando bolts down a corridor, total desperation. She's lost her gun, a crash behind her. The beast's shrill rage. She throws herself through the first available door and sees the interceptor waiting. She scrambles up a ladder through the hatch and frantically begins to activate systems. Sirens begin to sound in the launch bay. The interceptor's hatch closes as the twin gates of the bay begin to swing open and the beast is on her, striking the viewport in the hatch, inches from her face. She flips open a safety override on the interceptor's joystick and thumbs a red button. Exterior Rodina, total overdrive. The interceptor blasts through the half-open gates in a fireball of exhaust gases, the beast and the service ladder tumbling after it. Exterior space Stoiko, something streaks from the bow of the cruiser. 
interior officer, Jackson huddled over her screen. Missile! Missile! Exterior space, Rodina, interception in foreground. UPP missile takes out the station. Whiteout of nuclear explosion. The interception is, uh, interceptor is a black blot tumbling towards us like a singed leaf in a whirlwind. Interior ops room. The simulation of Rodina on Jackson's screen is surrounded by an expanding blue sphere. The sphere stops expanding. The simulation blurs into digital static, fades as the sphere begins to contract. Nuked him. 20 megs, that code of transmission. Send Mayday. I don't believe it. They sent for help. Their own people nuked them. Maybe they asked for it. That's an order, Jackson. Bishop looks at Rossetti as though he's about to offer an opinion, but doesn't. Maybe they'll nuke us too. No, they're leaving. Exterior space, Stoiko. The cruiser begins to move, accelerates, it's gone. In the ops room, bastards yeah and they violated the fucking arms treaty too didn't they well colonel rossetti how about the situation update we got let's see 56 missing crew members of 1500 hours dissolved too inside the mall deserted the only sounds are muzak and the trickle of artificial waterfall some signs of trouble an overturned trash canister, someone's red nylon baseball cap in the polished concrete. Walker strolls around a corner beside the bar with a pulse rifle, grenades, and assorted gadgetry slung across his chest. Goes to the bar entrance, entrance, nudges the door open with the barrel of the rifle. Nobody there. Some soccer game on the big screen, but the sound is off. Silent, cheering crowd rising to its feet. The flicker of the hollow game consoles. He glances around the mall, enters, crosses to the bar, Checks behind it, then finishes up the big plastic jug of liquor. Opens it and drinks from the jug. Behind him, a mug topples, clatters on the floor. He slowly lowers the liquor to the counter. Just as slowly, he turns. A beast is there, waiting, beyond the glimmer of the hollow game. Walker and the beast move simultaneously, but he doesn't go for his gun. He grabs the control unit hanging on his chest. An unmanned power loader walks straight through his glass facade, plowing tables and chairs out of its way. A big vice grip claws extended. The alien screams, leaps for it, but the steel claws close and grip. Walker twiddles the controls. The power loader responds, pinning the alien against the wall. The alien writhes and hisses, striking furiously at the hydraulic arms. Walker tightens the grip, locks the loader in place, and picks up the jug of liquor, liquor for another swallow. Fuck you. A beat as his satisfied grin is replaced by something else, the change. Interior eco module. Artificial dusk, Spence is crossing the micro metal with a wire basket of food for the module's population of small primates. Moths flutter through the narrowing beams of sunlight as the louvers gradually close overhead, crickets in the long grass. She enters the scaled down forest, ducking branches and Spanish moss, begins to make a tuck, tuck, tuck sound, calling the lemur, the monkeys, and stops, suddenly aware of the stillness and absolute silence, even the crickets. She turns and gasps. The primates have been cocooned in the branches of a tree and screams as something pounces on her from above, a transformed lemur, a very small alien. She bats the thing away with the strength of desperation. It hits the ground hissing. She hurls the basket of food at it and bolts from the forest, sobbing. Dissolve to a tunnel. Whine of an approaching engine, the six-wheeled carrier comes into view, Hicks driving alone. His face fixed, white. The carrier slews against the tunnel wall, strikes sparks, bounces off. He hardly seems to notice. He plows into a row of big plastic crates, tumbling them like a child's blocks, bringing the vehicle to a halt, a beat. He looks up from the controls, the doors of a freight elevator. Interior corridor of the mall. Automatic chime as the elevator doors open, revealing Hicks and his gun. In the mall, Hicks warily crosses, sound of perpetual music, his eyes the wreckage of the bar, but keeps moving. Into stuttering neon light from one of the shops, hiss and cackle of wiring, he moves forward to the shop, gun ready. In the shop, he enters, surveys the wreckage of display cases, scattered 21st century consumer toys. He finds five cocoons in the rear of the shop. In the mall, long on the shop, a beat, sound of five rounds from the pulse rifle. With the last shot, the neon flicker dies. The music stops. 
Hicks emergence continues across the mall. Arrives the elevator-like entrance to the mini subway, punches in his destination. Ops. Lights up in red. Muffled sound of the barking car. The door hisses open. On Spence, both hands white knuckled in the loop of the hanger strap, the car in abattoir, the uh, red with the blood of transformation, shredded clothing and rags of flesh. Spence. She screams. Interior ops room. Rossetti and Jackson are hunched over the screens and Hicks enters with Spence over his shoulder, brushing past two nervous Marines at the door. Bishop is making calculations on a console in the background and Hicks eases Spence down into a chair. Why is ETA for Kansas City? It's another 13 hours. Things don't look so shit hot out there right now, Rosette. What about rigging the fusion package? It's on the general alert. Routine lifeboat drill. A general fucking alert? Lifeboat drill? Who the hell do you think is going to be left to pick up? I say we do the fusion package now. Hicks, you took out the scrubber, the main air scrubber. Pretty soon there's isn't going to be anything left to breathe in there. And here, we'd be okay for about five days, except you also started an electrical fire and we've got no way to put it out. Cruise down 128. More than half? That's what I said. And you haven't rigged the place to blow? No. You'll lead the group from this sector, Hicks. At the alert, they'll gather at blue assembly points. Proceed to the nearest lifeboat bay. Colonel, my analysis indicates that a minimum of one-fifth of the 128 remaining crew members are likely incubating the... Listen to me, you motherless zombie. Those are people. Can't you understand that? And we're going to get them out. Yes, Colonel. I... You have your orders. I don't leave here until Jackson sets it to blow, Rosetti. You got that? Kansas City shows up. Maybe there's nobody left for them to pick up. Then what? They'll send a boarding party in here. Ugh, sorry, my computer's saying I can't. The fusion package is under the scrubber, Hicks. You trash the wiring, man. That's where the fire is. The, the lines. I can't link through. I can't set it. I'll go. I'll set it manually. I'll go with you. No. Assist with the, the evacuation. You just want your own ass out of here, don't you? <laughs> they couldn't have done this without your approval, could they? Hex. As one of the Marine guards stumbles forward, dropping his weapon, hands pray, upra upraised in claws of agony. Please, uh, uh, I. He trips, falls across Jackson's console in the barrel of Hicks' gun as half a dozen new model chestbursters erupt simultaneously from his torso in a spray of blood. Hicks bellows, jumps back, grabbing Spence. The chestbusters tumble from the body of a dead Marine, scuttle into the shadows. One leaves a trail of small bloody prints across Jackson's keyboard. Out! Out of here! Interior corridor. Hicks, Spence, Bishop, Rossetti, Jackson, and the remaining Marine guard hustle along. Hicks and the bishop bringing up the rear. Rossetti carries the dead Marine's pulse rifle. Bishop touches Hicks' shoulder as they reach the intersection. I'll try to give you an hour. Overload at 2200. Blow it. That's what matters. Extreme close up on Hicks' watch as he sets the alarm for 2200 hours. Yes. Bishop splits off down another corridor running. Interior lifeboat assembly point. Another intersection of corridors. A pathetic remnant of the Anchor Point's crew cluster beneath a flashing blue light. A dozen people, including Halliday, a woman Spence's age, Tatsumi, male Japanese, and a lab tech, male. Where are the others? There should be 30 people here. I, I can't find Tom. Where is he? I, what's going on? He's just here. I mean, there, but then... Forget it. He's probably already on the boat. You know him, right? Come on, we're getting ourselves out of here. Hicks pulls a service automatic from his vest and slips it to Jackson. Keep an eye on everybody, okay, Ops? Okay, you know all the goddamn drill. Done it often enough, right? We're taking A-52 to the blue concourse. We stick together. We'll meet up two other groups. Bay 5, proceed to board. What is happening, please? What is happening is we're getting on the boat. Move! 
Okay. Into the mall, <laughs> ten haze of smoke from burning insulation. Half the lights are out. A body floats face down in the pool at the foot of the waterfall. The pool is overflowing, splashing on polished concrete. Bishop emerges from a doorway and hurries along toward the freight elevator. He freezes, hears something else, moves quietly in the direction of the sound, the bar. He peers into the wreckage. Four aliens are at work, cocooning their prey. Cocoon bodies close on the face of Schumann have been glued to the big screen, where silent images of the soccer game repeat endlessly. Bishop stares, then turns and looks up. A queen. The thing towers above him in the mall, utterly still. A beat. He takes a step backward. Another. The queen's head sways. Another step. He bolts for the elevator. The queen screams her rage, scrambles after him like a famished mantis. He's reached the elevator, stabs desperately at the controls as the doors open and he's through, punching more buttons as the queen strikes her first blow buckling the steel doors. Interior freight elevator. Her huge stinger slashes in through a gap, whipping and slicing. Bishop braced up against it in a corner, uh, hand still on the controls. The elevator groans, shudders, begins to descend, then jams in the shaft. The stinger whips back out, sound of rending metal as the queen continues her attack. Interior corridor at bulkhead hatch. Jackson ducks through the, ducks through the first, still wearing her ops cap. Rosetti next, then Spence, helping Halliday. The others follow. Hicks bringing up the rear. Hicks pauses, looks back at the hatch, hears a distant crash, an inhuman cry. He takes a small bar of plastic explosives from a vest, his vest and squashes it against the edge of the bulkhead. Pulls a grenade from his harness, twists its neck and delay detonate combination, sticks it into the plastic and closes the hatch and runs. The smoke is getting worse. Interior blue concourse. Another of the white-tailed traffic tunnels is identified by a wide band of blue along either side. A small vehicle has overturned amid blood and torn clothing. Jackson and her party are skirting the wreck as Hicks catches up with them. Jackson whirls at the sound of running feet, bringing up the pistol. Easy, Jackson. Where you been? A distant explosion shakes the tunnel, jarring loose several tiles. They're following us. Left them something to slow them down. Might as well just try not to put a hole in the hole, okay? <coughs> Remember? <coughs> Air scrubber. Let's move. Interior freight elevator. Bishop on his knees, <coughs> running his hands delicately over the ripped plastic flooring. The queen hisses, bashes the door. He finds a seam, levers up his, with his nails, gets a grip. He pulls. Sense of android strength as the flooring comes up on pale streamers of super glue. The elevator shakes with queen's fury. He finds the section of the floor that can be removed, forces the glue cakes catches, slams down the hard heel of his hand. The panel falls away, tumbling through the smoke ward of uh, smoke toward a point of fire glow at the shaft's distant foot. Interior shaft. Bishop lowers himself through the opening, dangles. An emergency service ladder is recessed in one wall. He tries to reach one of the rungs with his foot, but the toe of his boot slips too far. He begins to swing back and forth like a gymnast, building up momentum, and lets go. He falls six feet before he manages to get a grip. He begins to descend the ladder. It's a long way down. Interior blue concourse. The lifeboat party emerges, coughing from a wall of smoke. Reaction shot. Dismay and amazement. The tunnel has been sealed with the pug of alien resin. Human bones, weapons, marine helmets protrude from the biomet convulsions. Uh, convolutions and the, of the resin wall. Another of the six-wheeled military carriers is skewed across the tunnel in a pool of blood. It doesn't want us to get out. It's bugs. Just fucking bugs. Come on. We're taking the bus. Which way, Ops? Um, <clears throat> way we came in, unless you think of something better. What's he mean, bugs? What is that thing? Where's Tom? Where's Tom? <laughs> okay, okay, here. Get up. There, there was an experiment. It got out of control. We have to go. What kind of experiment? Come on. Interior blue concourse. Tracking on carrier close on Hicks and Jackson. She takes a flat gadget from her jacket and flips it open. A miniature computer map of Anchor Point like a pocket video game. As she wiggles a tiny joystick, extreme close up on a miniature color screen. She's looking for an alternate route on lifeboats. Left at uh, B83, we'll, we'll cut through the agriculture up to a level to 
aeroponics. I mean, get into the residential level from there. And then it's up a surface terminal behind the central maintenance mainframe. Sounds complicated. This way. Flips the map shut. Spence is trying to come for holiday. Interior aquaculture farm. An automated fish farm, factory space range with dozens of waist high, round white vats of dark green water. Low ceiling, dim light. Sweeps rotate slowly across the water in some vats. Others are still with floating green vegetation. Hicks leads the party along a narrow aisle between the vats. Jackson pauses to check her map and watch. Hicks lights a cigarette, leans his elbow against the nearest vat. We're doing okay. The surface of the water beside Hicks' elbow erupts. The fish glow into feeding frenzy. He yelps and jumps back, dropping his cigarette. Bass, they're just hungry. Ready to be harvested? Sure, let's get out of here, okay? The others follow, keeping their distance from the bats. Interior elevator shaft. Bishop jumps down, dodges a dangled power cable, squints through the smoke, finds a manual emergency lever that opens the shaft's door. Interior tunnel. A blast of air fans the flames behind him as he steps out. The carrier is there among the scattered, cre scattered crates where Hicks left it. Bishop climbs in, tries the power. A feeble whine. Touches another button. The dash flashes battery recharge. He climbs down and sets off along a tunnel at Jog. Interior aeroponics farm. State of the art. Epcot style soilness cultivation. Tall A-frame structure of white styrofoam are studded with handled hundreds of precisely spaced plants. Their roots watered by periodic bursts of high pressure mist. Vegetables sprout from the sides of tapering styrofoam columns. All of this wreathed in a mist under brilliant halogen lamps. Hicks scans the chamber, gun ready, as the party emerges from a hatch in the white deck behind him. Ben has to have Halliday, whose cheeks are streaked with tears. Rosetti's up last, clutching his pulse rifle a bit too tightly, eyes darting around the chamber. Keep the safety on, Colonel. You could hurt somebody. He kneels beside the hatch, takes plastique and a grenade from his harness, and slaps together another bomb. What are you doing? They may be following us. He closes the hatch over the charge and locks it. Halliday starts to weep hysterically in Spence's arms, goes to her knees, then tries to curl into the fetal position on the white deck, shuddering, crying like a child. Rosetti rushes over as Spence is trying to get her to get to her feet. They'll hear you! Rosetti slaps Halliday's face hard, eliciting a piercing scream. Spence, no hesitation, punches him solidly in the face. His head snaps back and he's down, reaching for his rifle. Tableau, Spence, furious. Ready to kick ass, Halliday wide-eyed, stunned into silence by Spence's move. Rosetti with blood on his mouth and his hand on his gun. Try it! Hicks breaks the spell. Two-minute fuse, haul ass, people. The lab tech grabs Halliday, throws her over his shoulder, and runs. The others scramble after, new, after him, including Rosetti, whose drive to self-preservation is paramount. Hicks and Spence take up the rear. Hicks shoots her a grin as they run. Long shot down the aisle of aeroponic greenery, high-tech hanging gardens of Babylon, the lifeboat party approaching. Behind them, the hatch lifts off the hinges with the explosion, crashes back in the tang of tangle of metal. Several of the party are thrown on the deck. Hicks! Yeah. Look. He points down another aisle of aeroponic structures. The hell's that? Two of the styrofoam structures have been overgrown with a grayish parody of vegetation, glistening vine-like structures, and bulbous sacks that echo the alien's biomex motif. Patches of thick black mold spread to the styrofoam at the white deck. It was cabbages or something. Come, please, Jackson, which way? Spence said it did her monkeys too. Third door to the right! Interior tunnel near Fusion Package. Bishop comes loping down the tunnel, a certain effortless regularity evident in his run. Makes a turn in the chamber that houses the Fusion Package. Anchor points power source. The chamber is spotless, well lit. The only sign of the current disaster is the smoke. The Fusion Package itself is no longer than a Volkswagen bus, but it's obviously Anchor Point's art. Bishop climbs the narrow metal stairway in an overhanging control booth, resembling the inverted turret of a streamlined tank. A mirrored disc is mounted on the face of the armored hatch above a small slot. 
Please identify yourself. Bishop removes his dog tags. As he inserts one in the slot, he presses the palm of his other hand against the mirrored surface. Bishop, science officer, Hyperdyne A slash five mark three, serial number PL33581724388. Permission to inspect software safety protocols. Permission denied. Inadequate rank. Please refer request to your immediate superior. The slot tries to reject his tag and he shoves it back in. Emergency protocols. Code Theta 53, Authority Rossetti, comma, Schumann. Permission denied. Inadequate rank. Please refer request to your immediate superior. It ejects his tag. He drops his hand from the disc, stares at his reflection in the mirrored surface. He blinks, reinserts the dog tag, palm on disc again. Emergency protocols. Code Theta 53, Authority Wells, comma, Fox. The door hisses open instantly. He climbs in. Interior control booth. Surgically clean, unused, Jackson order, ordinarily runs the show from operations. Bishop settles into operator's chair facing three blank monitors. Protocols, safety. The central screen displays in an elaborate menu. Overload fail safes. The left screen displays a shorter menu. Bypass overload fail safe. A red light begins to flash. Permission denied, inadequate rank. Please refer to cancel request. Request display overload failsafe software. Request denied. Inadequate rank. Please refer to authority Wells, comma, Fox. The right screen displays an animated diagram. Thousands of interweaving lines and symbols moving ceaselessly, hypnotically. Bishop studies the screen with Zen calm. His hands poised like a pianist above the keyboard and makes his move. A cybernetic reprise of the uh, knife sequence that introduced them in Aliens. His fingers blur across the board with inhuman speed and accuracy as he races the fusion software security system. The lines on the screen squirm and shift. A window begins to open, faster, done. Bishop gazes at the screen with what might be the Android equivalent of voice quotal satisfaction, eyes bright. The screen displays a message, overload option reset. He, uh, he being, beings to reprogram the overload options. Interior residential married crew quarters. A maze of walls, doors, most of them open. Lights are on, but the smoke is thicker. Coughing, choking, Jackson shoves past the others into a large communal kitchen. On an electric range, smoke pours from a pot. <coughs> she grabs an extinguisher and blasts the pot's blackened contents. Turns off the element, smoke abates slightly. The quarters have an eerie Marie Celeste <coughs> quality. Food and drink on the table, a pack of cigarettes beside an ashtray, Spence pockets the cigarettes as she passes. Hicks opens a large white thermos, steam. He sloshes coffee into a cup and drinks. In the next room, a communal lounge, Spence leads Halliday to a couch and sinks down beside her, head in hands. Rossetti leans against an entertainment console, face blank, gingerly rubbing her his split, split lip. It's funny, but I had to win a contest to go through this, a science fair. My first prize in biology for all of Nebraska, momoclonal antibodies. Then I got into Cornell, another contest. It wasn't easy getting out there. Uh, we all must have also wanted that so bad, a whole generation or anybody. Anyway, the ones like me. Idealists. Yeah, I guess so. Build a new world, find ways to live in it, but it wasn't supposed to be like this and it might've worked. It almost did. Now look at it. Ending. Sits up and hugs Halliday, whose eyes are shut tight. What I want to know, mister, is why we had to bring you. Funding. Yeah, I guess you're right. You paid for it. I guess you get to fuck it up. Come on, time to move. Get her up. She gets Halli Halliday unsteadily to her feet. They move out in a tight group, Jackson leading, Hicks taking up the rear, Spence biting resolutely in her apple. Angle through a doorway, reaction shot, as Halliday's eyes fill with a new and deeper horror. Angle on the room, the preschool, a crutch, 
spattered with toys, the walls taped with children's paintings. Oh, God. Vince and the lab tech hurry her on out of the crutch. Halliday snatches a rag doll from a shelf as they pass. Interior tunnel away from the fusion package. Bishop leads the elevator shaft at its usual steady pace. Approaches the open door cautiously, listens. Nothing. He edges in, empty. The circuit fire has died down. Melted insulation still sputters. He looks up for the shaft. A long climb. He can make it out the bottom of the elevator. He reaches up, grabs a rung, sets his left boot on another, straightens up, and drives the jagged end of his broken knee joint through the side of his leg and the fabric of his fatigues in a gout of milky android blood. He hits the floor hard. The broken leg splayed in a hit at a hideous angle, the white fluid a widening pool. He struggles to brace his shoulders against the wall and reaches out to touch the ragged edge of artificial bone. Holly Corbin. Interior entrance of, to foot of mainframe service shaft, leaving residential. Hicks and Jackson shivvy the party through a low floor level service hatch. Interior service shaft. Uh, party's POV looking up. Ladders, platforms, catwalks, bundles of fiber optic, optic lines linking the components of Anchor Point's computer mainframes, drifting smoke. The bundled loops of fiber optics have a faint pearlescent glow. Hicks, as usual, is last up the ladder. Interior ladders and service shaft, various angles. The party climbing, Halliday still at the ragdoll, ragdoll, Hicks up last. Interior platform and service shaft. The Marine Guard from Ops emerges through a narrow opening. Spence and Halliday follow, and an alien strikes from the shadows, ripping out his throat. Spence dives for his rifle as skids across the platform, screams from the ladder below. The gun slips through her fingers over the edge, gone. Halliday cringes in a corner, cradling the ragdoll in her arms as the alien butches the dead Marine, slashing the corpse to the ribbons with its tail. It hisses, turns its head, Spence freezes. Interior ladder and service shaft. Hicks is desperately trying to fight his way past the others, climbing over them. Spence snatches a drum of the cable from the service cart and hurls it at the alien, distracting it from Halliday. The beast springs towards Spence, but she's already scrambling out a long, fragile-looking catwalk that quakes with her passage. The alien pursues her in the forest of cables with a hideous agility. Hicks clambers up through the opening, too late. Spence and the alien are out of sight. Interior fiber optic forest. Spence flattened against the mainframe, heart thumping, terrified. Takes a breath, looks out between two glowing trunks of cable, sees the alien's back 15 feet away. She bites her lip and slips out, runs. It screeches behind her. She blunders into another wall, a ladder, up the rungs, fast, into a short, narrow space lit by the single blue emergency light. No way out. She moves forward, hands sliding over a jumble of containers, sound of the beast swarming up the ladder. She's below the blue bulb now. Looks down at her hand on flat plastic case stenciled, Colonel Trans at 49, flare signal, oxy atmospheric, 20 millimeter. She tears at the catches. The beast is almost on her. She turns, bringing up the huge flare pistol and fires. The beast is blown backward off its feet. The igniting magnesium flare, a white hot chemical scar burning in its guts and flips back over the edge. Interior platform, the service shaft. Hicks in the lab tech see the burning alien fall as a weird pulse of light through the translucent cables. What the? Spence. Yo, Spence. Hicks crosses the catwalk, followed by the lab tech. Halliday stares after them at the head of a rag doll. In the platform service shaft, the others have climbed up. They watch as Hicks, the lab tech, Spence, recross the catwalk. Spence has the flare pistol around her neck on a lanyard. That's not how you hold a gun. Okay, people. Gotta move it now. Start climbing. Halliday. She rushes to the spot where we last saw Halliday. The rag doll lies on the deck. Spence grabs it up, flings it instantly away at the touch of slime. No, no! Hicks pulls an olive drab aerosol unit from his medical pack and drenches her hand with spray. Jackson's right. We gotta move. Rosetti is already starting up the ladder. Interior elevator shaft. Bishop climbing. He has his web belt cinched tight around his left thigh. The splintered bone is out of sight. The leg of his fatigues below the belt is soaked with fluid. He uses his arm's right leg to climb, the left leg swaying free, grotesquely, in too many directions, like the limb of a broken puppet. He shows signs of stress. The right knee might break at the next rung. He places it carefully, taking up most of his weight on his arms. He checks his watch. Extreme close-up. 
2100 hours, 40 minutes. Bishop's POV up the shaft. It looks like forever. Interior service shaft, another level. Jackson uses a pistol grip power driver to unscrew a ventilator grill. Hicks shines his light into the opening, then crawls in. Jackson follows, then Rossetti. Interior duct, hands and knees, single file, barely room for that. Hicks in his flashlight, clip bayonet style to his rifle. Jackson behind him, her cap reverse. How are we doing? Jackson stops crawling, flips open her map. Her features visible in the glow of the tiny screen. Uh, looks like another 10 meters. And we're, we're into a K-58A and straight into the boat base. Move. Hurry. Yes, sir. They move forward. Interior corridor duck exit. Had, uh, Hicks and Jackson prepare to pull the others one at a time, the waist-high opening. It's evident that the duct, at this point, slants sharply down from the opening. It's round and smooth and difficult to climb. From below, members of the party wedge their way up with knees and elbows. Hicks and Jackson pull Rossetti from the duct, both his hands locked around his pulse rifle, then the lab tech, then Spence. They reach for Tatsumi. Screams and frenzy bangle from the duct. Tatsumi's eyes pop wide, open any screams. Hicks braces his boot against the wall and hauls him out with the... Uh, with the jaws of freshly transformed new beast locked on his leg. Hicks whirls his rifle like an axe, the butt slamming into the thing's head. He hisses and twists back into the duck. Uh, interior duck, point of view of the trapped five, as the beast slides towards them down the smooth steel. Interior corridor duck, exit. Rossetti thrusts the barrel of his pulse rifle past Hicks into the duck and fires on full auto, emptying his magazine. Jackson dives for the gun as Hicks snaps him off his feet with a roundhouse punch. The back of Rossetti's head slams against the opposite wall and slides into the deck. Jackson's on him before he can recover, practically jamming the muzzle of the pulse rifle down his throat. Y'all know you, you yeah, you know you've always been part of me wanted me yeah, always been part of me wanted to kill one of you motherfuckers. Rossetti looks up at her. Go ahead. Very quiet. No sound at all from the duct. Tatsumi whimpers between clenched teeth as a wisp of acid smoke rises from his torn trouser leg. Hicks shines his light down the duct. Oh, man. Forget it, Jackson. Anyway, it's empty. He tosses her a fresh magazine. Hicks, the light. She and the lab tech are crouching beside Tatsumi, slitting his pant leg with a knife, exposing the wound. Watch out, it's on the cloth. The lab tech yelps as a droplet of acid touches his hand. Hicks unclips the light and passes it to Spence. Oh my God! The alien has taken a bite size of the small great bite the size of a small grapefruit out of Satsumi's cap. Flesh and muscle are blackened, charred by the acid. What's his name? Tatsumi. Cocktail for you, Tatsumi. He opens the kit, takes out a gun-shaped hypo with a pressure tank. Can't get this on the Ginza fella. Six times stronger than heroin. About eight other things in there to keep you up and rocking. Jabs the needle through Tatsumi's pant leg. He, the unit hisses. Get a marina year in the brig, playing R&R &R with one of these. Tatsumi moans softly as the shot hits him. Very clearly, in Japanese, he asks if it's time to go back on duty. What'd he say? I don't know. We'll have to carry him. You think he can get a dressing on? Not bleeding much, like it's cauterized. Get up, we're moving. I think you better hang on to the colonel's rifle. Interior mall, entrance to freight elevator. The doors look as though someone's gone after them with a giant can opener. They're ragged, gaping. Bishop's hands suddenly appear in the opening of the floor. Grip the edge, he hauls himself up, arms quivering with strain. The last thing through is his useless leg. He has to pull it up with both hands. He looks anxiously out into the mall. Nothing is moving, no aliens in sight. The queen's attack has torn loose a strip of alloy trim. Bishop uh, bends the double for... Bishop bends it double for strength and begins to work it beneath the belt around his thigh, still keeping an eye on the mall. Interior corridor to assembly point, lifeboat bay. Hicks and Jackson slogging along, dragging Tatsumi between them, Spence with the flare pistol, then Rossetti, then the lab tech. Smoke hangs in strata. Spence coughs. They're all feeling anchor points, fire depleted oxygen level. Tatsumi looks terrible, flushed, eyes glazed, but he's feeling no pain. He weakly attempts to sing a snatch of Japanese pop song, close up on his bandaged leg, leaving a trail of yellow drops. 
That's right, man. Not long now. Hey, Jackson. God damn, you were right. He's pointing his pulse rifle at a plastic sign mounted on the corridor wall. Lifeboat Bay, 20 meters. Huh. Had a map, didn't I? They round a corner. Ahead is one of the blue lights and another sign. Lifeboat launch assembly point. The other groups. Where's, where's everyone else? Well, how they could have launched already. No. He's looking at a wall panel with LEDs that indicate launch status of the lifeboats. The boats are all here. Then nobody else made it? Rosetti ignores them and keeps walking. I should have greased them. Shit, what's the point? The point? The point is let me run their fucking experiments. He could have stopped them, but he did. You tried, man, and you and Bishop and he let him do it. Shit, no. He's just brass. He's just like you and me to the people who brought this down. Wouldn't do any good to grease them either. Bullshit. Why not? Because what you want to grease is the company. Rosetti breaks into a stumbling run as he nears the portal at the end of the corridor, the entrance to the lifeboat base. Close up on Rosetti. Frantically punching a combination once that da- door open. He gets it, slides back smooth as silk, revealing a brightly lit room filled with the pristine space gear and an indeterminate number of aliens, their appendages tangled black and shiny as a pressed catch of eels. No, God damn it! no! Angle on the aliens, they stir as he throws himself back down the corridor toward the others. Hicks drops Satsumi, who sags into Jackson's arms. He raises his rifle, fires a bolt past Rosetti into the heart of the mass. Rosetti claws his way by Spence, lets loose with the flare pistol. All the ammo she has, but it's big red distress flare straight through the portal. It bursts. Crimson lightning scattered the aliens. Now everyone is backing down the corridor the way they came. Jackson burdened with Tatsumi. Rosetti fumbles with the combination on another door. Hicks is shooting as he retreats. Aliens come darting out past the dying uh, cherry brilliance of the flare, screaming down the corridor. The second door opens for Rosetti. He's through. The second lab tech on his heels. Interior and office. Dark. Only light from the corridor. Even less than as Rosetti immediately tries to slam and lock the door and spends his face. But the lab tech yanks him out of the way. The others tumble in. Jackson with Tatsumi and the fireman's carry. Hicks kicks the, the door shut and locks it as something slams into it hard. Jackson lowers Tatsumi to the carpeted floor. Hicks clicks his light on, swings the muzzle of his gun around the room, circle of light jumping from one thing to the next, an office larger than Rossetti's, 21st century stylistics, and a basic bureaucratic uh, banality. Fake teak, imitation leather, framed portraits of beaming Wayland with Yakuni big shots. Spence brushes a square object on a shelf, the base of a small hologram projector. A glowing DNA helix springs up. Don't touch anything. Tried to lock the door. Locked us out. Rosetti. Forget it. That's what he wants. You really want to do him the favor? What do you mean he, what, it's what he wants? I've seen it before in combat. Rosetti backs away from them. Hicks? Come here. I, I think it's Trent. He finds her around the corner of a padded partition that uh, screens a desk console from the rest of the room. His light finds the lab-coated corpse sprawled in the chair behind the desk. A quarter of its skull blown away, dried blood spattered across the bulkhead, a service automatic lo- locked in rigid fingers. Did himself. Hey, Rosetti, come here. Rosetti looks around the edge of the partition and sees Trent. That's it, man. That's what it looks like. You don't chill out quick. Somebody will do the same for you. Brilliant, man. Company man. Very... Ambitious. Hicks takes the light off the corpse, plays it around the cubicle, a shredder, empty file folders, a bulging plastic stack of shredded documents. Yeah. Hicks swings the light across the wall behind Trent's desk. The wall, Hicks. She spooked him. The safety's off the pulse rifle, but there's nothing on the wall. Only framed diplomas and between them a few stenciled letters. Jesus Christ, it's unlocked, Hicks. Airlock. She clambers over the desk console, shoves the corpse out of the way, and tears the diplomas from the wall, revealing the outline of a hatch and stenciled notice. Emergency airlock exit to hull sector 308. A crash from the corridor as alien hurls itself against the door. 
a chance. The only chance we've got. We, we get out on the we get on the hall, cross to the boats. We could try to get into the one that way from outside. Hicks looks down at his watch. Twenty one hundred hours, forty six minutes. If Bishops manage to set the fusion package to blow at twenty two hundred hours, they don't have a hope in hell. But why spoil it for Spence? Let's go for it. Spence hauls on the red airline style inset handle of the emergency airlock. The handle flips down and the hatch pivots smoothly open. A light inside goes on and the uh, e eternal sympathy voice announces. This is a five-man emergency atmosphere lock. Exit to hull, sector 308, equipped with five Mark 12 emergency suits. Each Mark 12 unit is charged with a two-hour air supply and is equipped with automatic radar beacon, intersuit radio, and magnetic soul plates. If you should experience difficulty with either the O-rings or the Velcro strips, please activate the secondary program for additional advice. There's six of us. Space suits swing from a rack, each helmet a different color. Rosetti's pressed up close behind her, eyes fixed on the suits. Fuck off, Rosetti. Anybody stays, it's you. Light, quick, somethings. The lab tech is backing away from Tatsumi, who lies on his back at the carpeted deck, mouth gaping, eyes showing whites. A tearing sound as Hicks spotlights Tatsumi's bandaged legs where the dressing is bulging, moving, seeping yellow fluid. A new model chestburster flails its way out of the wound and scuttles into the shadows beneath the chair. Twin red shot spots appear at Tatsumi's white shirt. Two more of the things rip their way out through his stomach as he arches backward, groaning. The groan cut off as a fourth chestburster pops from his mouth. Jackson brings her pistol up with both hands, arms locked, and shoots Tatsumi in the head. Get in the lock. Suit up. Interior emergency lock. Hicks pulls the inner door shut. The lock is white, bright, a very tight fit for the five of them. The lab tech reaches for one of the hanging suits, yells as the blood slick chest burner, burner loses its grip and tumbles out of the suit's open front. Ah! Hicks shoulders the door just to crack. It doesn't want to open. As Rossetti grabs a helmet and swings it under hand, knocking the little horror out of the lock, Hicks gets the door shut again. Spence is shuddering. Rossetti is putting a helmet on, reaching for his suit. Jesus, Rossetti, how'd you do that? I used to be a soldier. They hurriedly strip their underwear to their underwear and struggle into the suits. Rossetti has a yellow helmet, Hicks red, Spence blue, Jackson green, the lab tech orange. Spence sealing up her spacesuit over freckles and military issue bra. Hicks sealing its cover dog tags and his acid scarred checks. Chest. Please be seated. Fasten lap belts. Narrow ledges on either side of the lock. The five sit, strap in. Spence and the lab tech are either are on either side of Rosetti. The lab tech closest to the outer door. Hicks and Jackson are opposite them. You're right, Spence. I should have tried to stop them. I would have done no good, of course, but I should have tried. When we get back, there will be a board of inquiry. You can tell you can tell them, Colonel. Tell them what happened. Help them find the ones who are responsible. Ten second warning. Activating outer hatch. Rosetti's helmet turns slowly toward her. Through his faceplate bubble, the canceled eyes and blood streak drool of the change. <laughs> He's got Jesus! As blood wells up in Rossetti's helmet, filling it completely, and something dark begins to strike the inner surface of his face plate violently, again and again, the spacesuit hunches through the inhuman postures. As the outer pivots on, on hydraulics, the vacuum sucking small loose objects out into the void, the new beast in Rossetti's suit snaps at the heavy nylon lap belt and lunges at Spence. Her point of view is the blood bubble strikes her face plate. The fang tongue working like a pile driver, starting to split the tough plastic of Rosetti's space plate, tiny bubbles of blood along the first hairline crack. Angle on the lab tech, unfastening the seatbelt, grapples with the suited, suited beast, pulling it off Spence. Hicks is wrestling with his pulse rifle, pinned to the bench by the struggle. The suit radios are filled with the beast's thick gurgling roar. As it turns into the lab tech, flings out through the open hatch and bounds after him. Exterior hole airlock, vacuum zero gravity. The thing in Rosetti's suit catches the lab tech in mid-tumble, its gloved hands spread like talons, grips the lab tech's helmets and collar joint on either hand, and rips his helmet off. 
Air explodes from the neck of his suit, lifting his hair in a three-second gale that freezes instantly, becoming a small cloud of ice crystal. The lab tech's eyes are frozen marbles. He goes cartwheeling slowly across the hole as the beast grabs a protruding strut and spins the face of the airlock with a terrible billet grace. Hicks is, the on Hicks is in the hatchway. He raises his pulse rifle, pulls the trigger. The ammo counter flashes zero, zero, empty. Jackson reaches past him with a flesh magazine. Hicks slaps it in the gun and the beast launches itself toward him from the strut. He fires. The spacesuit explodes in a cloud of blood and acid. Hicks bounces awkwardly out over the rim of the hatch, followed by Jackson and Spence, a beat. Anchor Point's hull stretches away to its own horizon, a flat gray expanse broken by various structures. The body of the lab tech is tumbling slowly into space. He never knew his name. Hicks. Hicks. Are we going to make it? Hicks' gloved hand is closed around something small. He opens it, looks down, his watch. 2100 hours, 59 minutes. Hicks looks into her eyes as if he's seen her for the, sees her for the first time. Make it? Yeah, sure, we make it. Gives her a desperate grin. His gloved hand, still holding the watch, takes hers. Sound of the watch's alarm, 2200 hours. Hicks' eyes are shut again, but nothing happens. Hicks? Hey, Hicks, are you okay? What is it? He opens his eyes and looks at her, releases her hand. Extreme close up on watch. 2200 hours, one minute. Angle on Spence. She okay? He explains the watch away. It tumbles out slowly, level with the deck, keeps tumbling. Okay, Ops, which way to the boats? Me, man, this map was just for the inside. You see that radio mass? Let's try that way. They set out in single file across the hole. Hicks leading, Jackson bringing up the rear. The radio mass, visible above the horizon, is the tallest structure in sight. A steel thorn slanted towards the stars. Behind them, the airlock remains open, splitting light. Exterior hole, long shot. Three tiny figures, their helmets bright dots of color against the monotone hull plain, red, blue, green. Voiceover, steady rasp of human breath. Exterior hole, another angle, long. Shadows tangle in the light from the lock, moving. Black talons slip over the hatch rim, followed by an eyeless alien mask, then another. The creatures are entirely unaffected by cold, by vacuum. Exterior hull approach to lifeboat bays. Hicks, Spence, Jackson. Hicks gestures with his rifle, the prowls of the boats. There you go, Ops. Good navigating. Good guessing. Still about to get into one of the damn things. Spence loses her footing as she climbs down a ledge. Goes into slow motion, zero G roll, Jackson grabs her. Exterior hole shot from unlit lifeboat interior through a porthole. Hicks is approaching, closer. His gloves on the portal, porthole. His helmet bubble clicks against it. The beam of his light stabs in, swings from side to side, blinks out. Exterior hole lifeboat phase. Hicks straightens up from his portal. Looks good, good as it gets. How the hell we get in? I can run a bypass on the hatch latches, but I need a hot wire. You can strip some cable off the solar cells. Open it that way and we lose the air. We'll have to draw the backup off the tanks. Won't matter once we're hypersleep. No other way. Exterior top of lifeboat. Spence go V from helmet. She crouches over a flat rectangular solar cell and tugs with her glove tips a small access port. She keeps losing her grip. The spacesuit's gloves aren't designed for fine work. I like the science fair. And I just crunch everything. It's been a month. I stole bring a TV I got out of my uncle's basement. She manages to get the cover off. Tumbles backward, upward, with the momentum of its removal. Spence peers at a densely packed mass of color-coded wiring. Hey, Jackson, you want anything in particular? I am here and how about 20 centimeters of the red and green stuff? Spence begins to fumble with the wireling. Right. One, anything else while I'm here? Coffee in a Danish. Black one. Sugar. Exterior hole lifeboat. Hicks and Jackson are trying to open a large access port. 
This one beside a porthole set into a rectangular hatch in the bow of the lifeboat. It isn't easy. Hicks manages to hook the pulse rifle's butt plate under the edge of the cover. He uses the barrel as a lever. The butt plate slips. Shit. He tries again. The cover pops open. More wiring. Hydraulics. Jackson begins to fall at the wiring. Exterior top of lifeboat. Spence's POV as she looks down at her prize. A length of red and green wire. They're out of coffee, but I got your hot wire. Spence's POV as she glances up across the hole and sees a dozen advancing aliens. Hicks, they're coming. They don't need suits. Exterior hole lifeboat. Hicks whirls around with the rifle, too quick for a zero G. Momentum spins him around and he rolls out past the prow, but manages to come up shooting. He takes out the two foremost aliens at about 20 yards. The rest scuttle for cover. Extreme close up on ammo readout, nine. Anglon Hicks, as he gets to his feet, takes a step back and nearly tumbles again. He's bumped into another emergency airlock, this one still sealed. He climbs back across it and crouches against the raised housing, using it to steady his aim. The aliens charge again, five shots, five aliens blown apart. The rest get out of sight. Extreme close-up on ammo readout, four left. Six inches from Hicks' faceplate on the airlock hatch, a red light blinks on. The lock starts to open, Hicks scrambles back. The rifle ready at his hip as the hatch opens, a space-suited figure straightens up a yellow helmet. Close up Hicks reaction shots. Rosette. Angle on the aliens charge. The figure turns, bringing up a pulse rifle. Close up on Bishop through the faceplate as he does a full clip into the aliens, killing them all. Hicks, help me out of the lock. Hicks takes Bishop's arm and hauls him over the rim. The android's left leg is braced with the length of metal from the elevator, strapped in a spacesuit with heavy silver tape. Well, what happened? You didn't blow the fusion pack at 2200. Bishop passes him a fresh clip of ammunition. The overload is scheduled for 2230. Why? I thought you might need the time. Bishop? Hicks, come on, we gotta get this happening. Hicks helps Bishop cross the hole. Exterior hole, lifeboat. Close up on Spence and Jackson crouching by the open service port. They've made a rainbow spaghetti out of the port's wiring, but Jackson holds one raw end of her hot wire. Spence looks up as Hicks and Bishop arrive. What happened to your leg? Molecular fatigue. Bishop says we gotta go now. No shit. Well, thrust the hot wire against the contact, producing a burst of sparks. Nothing happens. She tries again. Nothing. Third time's the charm. A bigger burst of sparks. The hatch suddenly pops open with a rush of escaping air. Woo! Hot damn. Okay. Jackson ducks, wedges helmet and shoulders through the opening, and a queen sized stinger erupts through the back of her neck, slicing the suit's alloy collar ring like butter. Brief but horrible sound on radio. Jackson! Jackson's being drawn into the open by Unseen Queen. Spence clutches furiously at Jackson's suit, trying to pull her back. Forget it, she's gone. Hicks! Hicks and Spence turn, reaction shot. What they see makes her forget, trying to save Jackson's body. The boots of Jackson's spacesuit vanish through the lifeboat hatch. A queen, her crest rising against the stars, leads the swarm against them in a solid wave. Hicks pumps the pulse rifle grenade launcher. Sheer reflex, no consideration for the effective recoil in zero G. Pulse charges have been assumed to be recoilless. The recoil kicks him back against the lipo as the blast takes out five of the charging aliens. Sharp clang of his helmet against the boat's hull. Close through faceplate, Hicks losing consciousness. Bishop stands alone against the advancing swarm, the boot of his locked suit leg wedged in a narrow channel in the hole. <laughs> He fires with robotic accuracy, the rifle pivoting like the barrel of an automatic gun turret. Close on Bishop's expression. No anger, no fear, just total absorption in the task at hand. Spence has Hicks gun, dragging him to his feet. Extreme close up on Bishop's, Bishop's ammo readout, working down to one, steady as seconds on a stopwatch. His last round is for the towering queen. Androids don't miss. Straight into the jaws, her head explodes but the headless body doesn't stop. It stumbles, tumbles forward, flips over, the vast abdomen with its lashing stinger outlined against the stars. As Bishop tugs his wedged foot free and rolls, the stinger whips around to gauge a, 
uh, gouge a chunk of bright steel from the hole. The carcass smashes into the lifeboat. The swarm twitches, hesitates. With the loss of the queen's unifying intelligence, the aliens are reduced to their usual level of instinctual action. Bishop, come on. Hicks with Spence is fleeing across the hole, taking the long zero-G leaps. No more worries about drifting away. The mast, Bishop. The radio mast. Bishop starts after them, abandoning his empty pulse rifle, trying to bound along it on his good leg. The stiff one obviously in his way, three aliens rapidly gaining on him. He loses his balance. Hicks and Spence have almost reached the foot of the radio mast. Handholds lead out to the tip. Hicks and the bishop, Hicks sees Bishop struggling to right himself, the aliens closing in, snatches the rifle from Spence. Go on, get out there. Hicks recrosses the hole to Bishop, shoots the nearest alien, gets a grip on Bishop's suit and pulls him up, tries for the second alien but misses. They start for the mass and Hicks firing back to, at the swarm. Spence is a third way out of the mass, body drifting in space, clinging to a handhold. Hicks and Bishop haul themselves hand over hand along the mass. Using package, Hicks. Overload. Yeah, but it means we win. Come on. The swarm closes around the foot of the mass in a single writhing mass. One springs into the handholds and scuttles out along the mass like a spider. Hicks blows it off. Extreme close up on ammo readout, four left. Four minutes to overload. Hicks blasts another alien as a deafening squawk of feedback rattles in suit radios, followed by a wave of static. Exterior space. The UPP interceptor, pitted and scorched by the new king of Rodina, settles towards the anchor point on steering jets. Close up on Gunport, sliding smoothly open, revealing the vicious looking snout of a Gatling style pulse cannon. Steer mass from Hicks' point of view, a stream of withering fire cuts a swath through the swarming aliens. Come, you come! Followed by a frantic burst in her own language. Exterior space from mass. Spence's point of view as the interceptor nears the mass tip, cannon still pumping. The airlock in the interceptor's lower surface slides open, light from inside. Spence kicks off from the mass, manages to grab the rim of the interceptor's airlock. Hicks fires his last round into the alien on the mass. The interceptor still coming down, crumpling the tip of the mass in a burst of sparks as Hicks, Hicks and Bishop kick off. Hicks grabs Spence's free hand, Bishop grabs Hicks' ankle. Spence hauls them into the cramped space of the airlock. The lock closes on an, as an alien launches itself from the mast. Interior interceptor airlock. Sound of the alien as it slams into the lock. Hicks, Bishop, Spence are crammed in like sardine, sardines. Exterior lock. The alien scrambling furiously for a hold. Inside as the interlock opens and the commando plunges her tattooed arms and the yank space spins free. Spence fumbles with her helmet and snaps it off. Bishop pulls himself from the lock in spite of his leg. He dives for the ship's controls. His hands dart from one switchboard to the next. Nothing happens. He looks up through his faceplate at the commando. Go. She looks at him impassively, a beat, then reaches past to press the sequence of three buttons. Exterior space, the interceptor. The aliens cluster like aphids in the mast, yet interceptor's engines erupt in a gout of flame. Exterior space, another angle. The alien on the airlock loses its grip, tumbles into the rocket blast. Exterior anchor point, interceptor's point of view. The station receding, the fusion package goes overload, white out, a beat. Fade to black. Fade in, a single star, then another star, then the interceptor. Adrift, showing no lights. Exterior interceptor, another angle. Additional damage visible from the anchor point's blast. Interior dim light. The commando is slumped against the wall of the dead switches, watching Bishop. Hicks, Spence, and Bishop wear their spacesuits, minus helmets and air tanks. Bishop is bending over a panel of exposed circuitry, working with a delicate probe. His suit is open to the waist. He wears a miniature work light on the band across his forehead. Spence is asleep, her head on Hicks' lap. Bishop. Bishop looks up, the beam of the work light glaring in Hicks' eyes. Yes. Bishop, or Spence and I, I mean, are we infected, man? A small, steady, steady tone sounds, muffled inside Bishop's suit. He puts the probe down and reaches into his suit, bringing out his wristwatch. He looks at the time, the tone stops. He puts the watch down and looks at Hicks, a beat. No, you aren't. I obtained solid parameters on the incubation period. Neither of you is a carrier. 
neither is she. Although I couldn't be certain until... Your watch. Until your watch went off. Yes. Bishop reaches into his suit again and brings out a service automatic. The com commando says something angrily, warily, in her own language. Bishop hands her the gun. She tosses it aside with evident disgust, curls up, eyes closed. That was for us, if we were... Yes. She's dying, Hicks. Radiation poisoning. Can we do anything? No. Spence groans in her sleep. Hicks absently smooths her hair back from her eyes. You're a species again, Hicks. United against a common enemy. Hicks moves Spence's head, pillows her on a folded jacket, swings his way over to the commando, offers her water from a plastic squeeze bottle, and she refuses it. Yeah. The source, Hicks. You'll have to trace them back, find the point of origin, the first source, and destroy it. I don't know, Bishop. Maybe we just ought to stay out of their way. You can't, Hicks. This goes far beyond mere interspecies competition. These creatures are to biological life what antimatter is to matter. How do you mean? There isn't room for both of us, you, Hicks. Not in this universe. That's crazy, Bishop. No. We're already at war, Hicks. War to extermination. The alien knows no other mode. Well, hell, man, we've been at war all my life. Near enough, anyway. With her. But with all our brothers and sisters. That's what got us into this shit in the first place. But now you've seen the enemy, Hicks. So is she. She's not it. Neither are you. This is a Darwinian universe, Hicks. Will the alien be the ultimate survivor? Hicks doesn't answer. He just looks at Bishop. Bishop goes back to his circuitry. Close on Spence's sleeping face in the face of the dying commando. Dissolve to exterior space. Approach of a large ship. The ping of a homing radar. Angle on the hull as it slides past enormous letters. Kansas City. Exterior space angle up. From below, Kansas City is a wide bay opens. The interceptor comes into frame and is drawn up into the brightly lit hold. The bay closes. Exterior space, Kansas City receding, gone. The stars fade out. The end. And that is William Gibson's first draft for Alien 3. Thanks for watching. We'll see you at the next one.